Gustavo. Good morning and welcome to the 21st meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please remind everyone present to please turn off any mobile phones or other electronic devices that they may have. The first item of business this morning is to decide where to take items 3, 4 and 5 in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business today is to take evidence on Scotland's public finances post-2014. We have two panels to hear from today. And uh, the first panel uh, consists of Rachel Holmes. Good morning, Rachel, and welcome to the committee. M uh, members have copies of Rachel's written submission, so we'll go, so we'll go straight to questions from the committee. And uh, what um, uh, happens at Finance uh, uh, Committee, Rachel, is I'll open with some questions, and then, of course, I'll widen out the, the session to include other members uh, round the table. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for coming along, and thank you for uh, submitting your uh, paper. Um, I notice that in, uh, in uh, you, your paper uh, you say that, and I quote, there is little opportunity for change to suit specific circumstances, be they economic, demographic or social, of Scotland. Um, and uh, you say with a no vote there's little further, dis further discussion to be had in terms of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, I'm just wondering if you can, uh, if you can uh, tell us actually um, whether or not uh, you feel that, that uh, Scotland... Uh, has the tools that are needed uh, to boost the working age population, for example, in employment, immigration or uh, fiscally? In my view, no. Um, if we're talking about the pensions brief, um, which I know has been quite a large part of this committee, um, for us to do anything to address any of the issues that have been raised around pensions, um, we do need those powers. If there is a criticism of Scotland in having, in some way, a higher ageing population than the rest of the UK. Uh, I would argue that's the case for actually doing something about that. <clears throat> and that involves a range of measures, um, one of which, of course, is having control of immigration policy, which we have none. And in my view, from what I've read, from what I've watched on the news, from what I've read in various briefings, uh, Immigration is a very different political topic um, from it here from what it is in the south of England. There's a different political agenda to an extent, not completely, uh, but I would argue that uh, population densities, existing levels of immigration are different from the south of England and from here, and therefore it would benefit Scotland to increase or at least encourage educated, talented, ambitious young people to come to Scotland. And with the current immigration policies, I don't actually see how we can do that. Okay. <clears throat> you say in, in your paper that, and I quote, the UK's low in rankings of countries in terms of provision for pensioners. Many countries, often those with small populations, do better. And understand that there's around 13 million people of working age in the UK are under saving for retirement. Um, what, in your view, have been the decisions taken by successive UK governments which have contributed to this pensions crisis, and what could have been done differently? The crisis has been there, I would argue, from before the financial crisis, 2007-2008. Um, it has been brewing, it has been recognised as being a problem. Um, this can go back as far at least since I became interested in these sort of topics, uh, as 1997, um, with the, I think it was the first budget of Gordon Brown uh, to take uh, taxation from dividend income earned by pension funds. And that's had, over the years has had, I believe, quite a substantial hit on the, the growth of those funds. So there's one, one element there which has hit pensions, and, and that's going back quite a way, but it has never been revoked by successive UK governments. Um, so there's scope there. The, um, some people call that a raid on the pensions. Um, I would also argue that the, the new, one of the newest reforms has not been helpful for pensions. Um, the, the reform whereby um, people who have saved into a private pension scheme all their lives um, and have had the tax uh, relief on that at the highest and the additional rate, some 
you know, people at higher earning levels, they are now able to cash in their lump sum and take it in its entirety and spend it how they want. They've had tax relief on pension savings, which then will not be forced into being in an annuity. And this has been described not, not by me, but by uh, OCD and various other pension bodies um, in various terms, including reckless. Um, so I'd argue, argue that this sort of, I think they called it the Lamborghini reform, um, where you can take the money and spend it how you want. There, there's no provision, there's no enforcement to have to take a, an annuity there. I think that's also problematic for the future. Um, it's also going to mean that while government gets income tax revenues from that lump sum up front, there is no longevity to those revenues as the annuity is paid up, uh, down and taxed. Uh, so there's a longevity in the tax income that's coming that we've lost there as well. Um, so that's a sort of second aspect to that. Um, another one which I believe is to do with fairness um, is the, 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 the way our tax system works and the way it works for pensions. We actually have a, a fairly progressive tax system in the sense that it taxes different income bands at, at higher and higher levels. We now have uh, basic... Um, higher and additional rate if you discount the lower savings rate. Um, so you could argue that's progressive at some level, but when you start applying it to tax relief, it becomes regressive. It means that people who earn the most are uh, capable of getting the most relief. So you can save into a pension fund and you're getting relief at 40% and 50%. Now, arguably, when you've got poorer people who actually can't afford to save at all, um, I think there's an ethical or moral or a fairness equality argument there for saying there, needs, there could be an element of redistribution there um, to even this ever widening um, income, you know, wealth gap between the poorest and the richest in this country. Um, so for me, that's a problem. Uh, the other problem there with the way the pension schemes work is um, you can pay. Now it's up to forty thousand pounds annually into pension fund and get the tax relief. Um, whichever is higher, 100% of your earnings or £40,000. That has come down in recent years. Only a few years ago, that amount was £250,000. A single individual could save and attract tax relief as a lump sum in a year of savings. Um, that has come down, but uh, that's only come down because of the financial crisis. Government's needing to boost its tax income again. And... Um, I suspect, I, I can't be sure of this, the Lamborghini provision is one way of appeasing the people that have, um, I'll say, suffered in inverted commas from the removal of that amount of pensions input relief. If Scotland had control of pensions, what could we do that would be Well, it would be, it would, it would, for me, it would be a, a, a really good opportunity to take a step back, look at where we're at, and look at the specific requirements of Scotland um, we are in a different risk category in terms of life expectancy from the rest of the UK. Um, you know, we've got one policy that's coming from London, um, and yet we're having to um, apply that policy across the board when actually we, we, have, we, we have different circumstances. And for me, it's a chance, A, to look at equality, fairness, all of those issues as the politicians... Uh, desire and as the electorate that elect the politicians desire um, it's also a chance to look at um, how we structure it, how we apply tax reliefs, where we might want to encourage poorer people to at least have the opportunity to benefit from, from some of those tax reliefs um, which in my view they're unfairly disadvantaged at the moment Okay, thank you now, <clears throat> I'm going to let colleagues in in a minute or so but uh, you say uh, uh, also in your paper that, and I quote, comparing the UK state pension provision to the rest of the world, the Melbourne Mercer Global Pension Index scores the UK at a C plus, alongside Chile, while smaller nations such as Denmark, Netherlands, Australia, Sweden, and Switzerland are ranked above with A or B ratings. And you say that the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development indicated that under UK pension provision, the average person might receive 32.6% of their final salary from the state once they retire, which is the lowest proportion in Europe. The average equivalent figure for the total 34 countries measured was 40.6%, but Austria was 76.6%. Now, given that Scotland uh, spends a smaller share of tax take in GDP and social protection, um, which includes pensions, the UK as a whole, does this mean that Scotland is better able to afford the cost of state pensions? At the moment, I would argue yes. I would hope that in time 
the age differential, the life expectancy figures of Scotland, which are horribly lower than the rest of the UK. I would hope we would be able to address that with the right policies and so on. But yes, given the current figures, uh, the agreed figures, then yes, you, you, you have to agree that, that at the moment they are more affordable. I would also argue there's risks... Um, there's risks with staying with the current system, and the United Kingdom is severely in debt as a nation. Uh, there's very little Scotland can do about that. Um, there's an argument for saying that, you know, people talk about the risks of us taking ownership of our own pensions provision, but I would argue there's also some quite severe risks facing the UK as it goes forward. And we can see that the, the, the pension provision from the UK and its state pension provision um, is in nothing really to write home about. Um, and that, that's independent groups. I see the OECD, as you mentioned, um, has also placed the United Kingdom just about bottom of the league, just above Mexico. I've got that report there. So it's not like we have this fantastic... Uh, benefit or uh, provision as it is at the moment. I I'm not quite sure why Scotland could do any worse um, if it were to manage its own pension provision. OK, thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm going to open up the session now to colleagues around the table. First person that has questions will be Malcolm, to be followed by Jean. I mean, you make some general criticisms of pensions. I'm sure um, many of your points people might well um, aspire to um, agree with you, but I mean, I'm not quite sure about your assumption that it would inevitably be better under independence. I mean, you say we're better able to afford the cost of the state pension, but do you not think the, the indicator used last week by most of our expert witnesses of pen, pension expenditure per working uh, adult is, in fact, a, a pretty valid indicator of the affordability of pensions? That indicate the question is if there's a problem, as you say, how do you address it? And at the moment, the problems we face here, or whatever indicators you want to choose, we have absolutely no power to address them. So I would argue that if, you, if there is an issue, if you choose to take that particular indicator, um, then what can we do about it? And at the moment, there's very little we can. These issues are reserved to Westminster. Now, they are quite rightly making decisions for the majority, those that elect them and the majority of the people, and the majority of the people aren't us. We're 8%, I think, of the MPs in Westminster, just about less than 10% of the, the population. So I'm not saying that in any way Westminster is deliberately punishing or penalising Scotland. What I'm saying is the situation we're in in terms of the arithmetic is not helpful to us in terms of doing what we either want to do or need to do. I don't really accept your assumption that our circumstances are fundamentally different. They are in the sense that, unfortunately, um, on average, people are not living so long. But obviously, that's one of the key problems that we need to address. But, you know, sticking my, with my original point, you would accept that even at present, pension ex expenditure per working age adult is, um, is, um, is, is higher in Scotland than it is in, in the rest of the UK. And unless we have the high immigration scenario that you outlined, then that's going to get um, more accentuated in the years to come. And I'm not necessarily arguing against the high immigration scenario, although I think there are problems about doing that within a common travel area. I disagree with you on the high immigration. I think we need immigration, and it needn't be high. We already have, I can't remember, it was 24,000 net immigration as it is. And I think the figures, I'm, not, I'm no expert on immigration and numbers, uh, but I don't think this idea that it's a scary high figure, if, if people find that scary, as you say, you don't, and I don't either. Um, it's an emotive topic, as we know from the way some of the press report it. Um, I don't necessarily think that the immigration needs to be that drastic to address these problems from what I've read. Um, the other point is, if you're saying you have indicators and so on that say we're ill-equipped or unable to fund our own pensions. I, I would really like to argue why that situation has arisen. Um, we are less equipped, you could argue, than other European nations, and yet they seem to be managing quite well, Some nations of similar size and demographics and so on. Um, I, I would argue that's the case for saying there's something not quite right about the current situation. I, I don't. Some of those countries obviously have higher levels um, of taxation, which it's um, not, I think, proposed under certainly the, the Scottish Government's white paper. I mean, talking about the white paper, I mean, I'm not saying that you need to be committed to the proposals in the white paper, but 
is it not is is one of the significant things in the white paper that notwithstanding certain uh, variations such as keeping savings credit, the actual structure of pensions and to a large extent the regulation of pensions and the, and the fundamental structure of uh, pensions is actually very similar to what we have at the UK level in, in the white paper that's been proposed. I think that's fair. I mean, I, I'm kind of a gradualist about any kind of change. I often think it's better to um, work with what you have. And I, I think I've put that in my paper. I think any any changes in what, what we would do as a, a Scottish Parliament with power and control over pensions policy would need to be taken with a great deal of consideration and a great deal of um, thought. And, you know, no one's saying that, that if there was a yes vote, I, I don't think any of you, whoever of you are in power, um, should in any way make any sweeping drastic changes. I think these things will happen incrementally. They will happen slowly. Um, but they will, they will happen where they need to happen or where... You MSPs who have the decision-making powers, um, you decide what's best. When you rightly criticise the, the the policy of wealth, wealthier people benefiting most with tax relief at the higher rate, is is that a, is that a, changing that? Is that part of the white paper proposals on pension? If it is at the moment, I'm no. not. Uh, I haven't. So, you, so you will you will know that the Labour Party at a UK level is going to abolish tax relief at the higher rate which uh, I presume you know that, presumably that rather undercuts your argument that only through independence can we fundamentally change pension policy. I could argue that, that's a, that that satisfies my personal views on equity, equality and so on, but um, it, it's, it's taken a long time. And, you know, I've, I've, you can still invest £40,000 a year if you have it and get tax relief um, on your pension investment. So there's still... You know, this is my personal views about equality and redistribution of wealth and so on. Um, I, I, I would applaud the Labour Party personally for doing that, but we, we will be dependent on getting a Labour government to do that. Thank you. OK, Jean, to follow by Jamie. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for your paper. Interesting. Um, I wanted maybe just to go back to the uh, comparison with, uh, with other countries and um, the much higher levels of, of uh, pensions. Is that all to do with uh, investments that are made by these countries so that they actually have a pension pot which we don't have? Or is it also uh, in relation to do some, do the countries that pay higher pensions pay higher contributions as well? Is it is it tied up with other things? Are there other benefits? I mean, you can never look at something just on its own. So are there advantages in other ways that we enjoy in this country in terms of medical care or other things that you would see that people don't have, that have higher pensions? There's a, there's a big picture there, Jean. As you say, and, you know, you're not just... I mean, we've been talking about state pension provision... Um, the comparators we have and and actually the, the, that that's a comparison uh, some of those comparisons of state pension across different nations are based on proportions of your salary average salaries and so on so they, they've kind of we taken out stripped out the the um other variables but yeah you're you're right it's a complicated picture and it's not an exact science mm -hmm. um in terms of, um, my understanding is in terms of state versus private provision, the UK is one of the better ones in terms of people having their own private provision, um, which, you know, I, th I think that's a good thing, and hence why I, I disagree with the, the, the Lamborghini uh, reform that's just come in. Um, I think people, if they've had the tax relief, they should be forced to take that as a pension, an annuity, so that they're not spending it all now and dumping themselves on the state 20 years' time. Um, in terms of government, uh, Mr Chisholm mel m mentioned higher tax rates. Yes, some of these countries do have higher tax rates, Norway for example, but their average income is also proportionally higher. Per capita, they are without a shadow of a doubt wealthier than we are, even with their higher tax rates. So saying, oh, they pay higher taxes, for me, isn't the argument. The argument is, what, what are you left with per capita GDP wealth per capita, if that's your chosen measure? Um, and, you know, a lot of these countries are better off than us. In terms of investment, um, the most notable ones that do have sovereign wealth funds, I don't have my sovereign wealth fund paper on me, um, some of them have them even without oil wealth. 
but just about, I think, everyone who has oil wealth, apart from the UK and one other, is it Iran? I'm, I'm not sure about that. Is it Iran or Iraq? It's Iran. It's Iraq, yeah. Um, we're the only ones that hasn't invested a penny of our oil. And for me, you know... People say, oh, the oil's running out. Yes, yes, it will run out. Yes, it will run out. I can't tell you when. But what are we going to do with what's left? Um, it's been used to fund tax cuts at UK level over the past 10, 20, 30 years. It will continue to be used as such. There will be no oil fund, in my view, if we carry on uh, sending the oil wealth to Westminster. Um, what is crucial for me, if we are going to pollute the atmosphere with oil, if we are going to use it, um, let's invest it for the future. Um, Norway has the biggest, the biggest fund in the world, the biggest single collection of assets. They can move the market every time they trade in it. it, it you know, it's astonishing how, how, what they've done with their, their money. They've saved it. And it's generating income every year in perpetuity um, that they, they will use for their pensions. And I do believe it is, is if I'm right, it's in the white paper that at least part of Scotland's oil wealth it will be put aside not only to fund future pensions or in part but also to stabilise the revenues um, year on year to smooth them so this you know, volatility can be coped with sorry I, that's a, not a full answer to what is quite a full question slightly moving away from pensions but you've been studying you've been studying the experiences of overseas Chinese students and I just wonder whether you could talk about that and the advantage uh, to Scotland and, and how it enhances or um, how we make best use of, of our universities reputations in that in that sphere yeah, I'll, I'll this is my doctoral research that I'm currently studying towards. Um, I, I teach at the university and quite often a significant proportion of my classes are students who've just come off the plane from the overseas. Um, for me, it's an ethical argument about how we best educate them, how we best uh, give them an experience that they can expect to receive in line with what other students receive, uh, coping with language and so on. It's also important for the UK and Scotland as a, a, a source of educational income. Um, the universities, as we know, have expanded. Government funding hasn't quite expanded along with it, either in England or in Scotland, although in Scotland we pay our students' fees, our home students' fees. Um, and so it's an important income stream for our universities now. And on my university's agenda, internationalisation is part of the new strategy, has been before, and it's probably on the agenda of most universities um, around Scotland and the UK now. So it's an important income stream, and universities are now becoming more dependent on it. Um, again, we're coming back to the immigration policy issue here. Um, we are having to impose on our students some very strict immigration requirements, uh, we are having to, um, it's called Tier 4, the university is having to implement a lot of very strict administrative requirements to um, allow these students to come and study with us. Um, it's becoming to the point where we are now having to compete with countries like Australia, um, who have slightly more relaxed immigration requirements when it comes to students, and we are now having to fight to get these students in now. They are, there's threats to them going to India and Australia now. Um, which is a threat to us and our numbers I think this year I can't speak with exactitude um, they're certainly not growing as much as they were a few years ago and for me immigration have, this parliament having powers over that would be beneficial to Scottish education okay, um, <clears throat> Thank you uh, want to return to the issue that Malcolm Chisholm uh, touched on he was uh, highlighting the evidence the Pensions Policy Institute provided uh, us uh, where uh, there was I think he was expressing a concern about the uh, cost of pensions per uh, uh, adult of uh, working age but of course their paper it uh, was predicated on the Office of National Statistics uh, uh, low uh, population growth estimate which I think was about 7,000 per annum you yourself have made the point that it's closer to 22,000 in actuality and uh, uh, they, the Pensions Policy Institute, accepted that if you use the higher uh, estimate, which is actually closer to actual levels, there would be a better cost per working age adult for pensions than the UK as whole. Well. Would you accept that hypothesis? I don't know if you've seen the evidence they gave us, but would you accept that hypothesis? And does this sort of come back to the issue you've 
refer to about having control over the levers that can influence these factors? I do, I do think we need... What was the paper you referred to there? It was the Pensions what? Policy Institute oh, evidence yeah, yeah. they gave us last week. Yeah. Um, I, I think we need control over that. I think we need... I mean, our young people are going... I've, I've, I read um, Bell, Comerford's and Iser's paper yesterday, and there was one graph they've got in there that's very telling. It's a graph of the... Um, immigration from, sorry, the emigration net to England or the rest of the UK and the net emigration from the rest of the UK into Scotland. And the graph sort of crosses each other, crosses itself um, at particular points for me. And it seems to me the age group's 18 to 39 on my graph here in the paper um, show that it's the young people that are leaving Scotland to go south. My brother's an example of that. He's in London with his nephew. We don't see them that often. And for me, what we need is the young people to be staying in Scotland. It's the older people that tend to repatriate here. Um, and for me, that's part of the problem. It's the immigration not only from outside of the UK attracting young, talented people like my brother-in-law, who's Polish, he's a lawyer here. Um, that's what we need to be attracted here. And we also need to keep the young people that we grow up and educate here. It would be good to keep them here, not only socially, but also for, for um, you know, putting back what they've, they've received from the country. So, yeah, I do think that's an important I aspect. that's a, a case of trying to provide them the opportunities here in Scotland that yeah. they, they feel they have to go elsewhere. So, yeah. to, and again, that would contribute positively to the issue of uh, cost it would of pensions to the population. It, it would contribute to pensions because they would be here generally either creating wealth or uh, paying taxes from public sector payment wages. Um, but it would also um, be beneficial because the ratio of old to young would be rebalanced. It would address that criticism that we are somehow more ageing than the rest of the UK, which I agree we are marginally, but certainly not as much as many countries in Europe. Um, and that was a fact pointed out in the Bell's paper. Um, that I read yesterday as well. So Scotland, it, it might be worse than the UK in terms of ageing, depending on what indicator you take. It's certainly not bad in comparison with the rest of the UK. And if there is an issue with an ageing population in Scotland, we need to be able to do something about that. Women have been treated poorly by the UK pension regime. Can you talk a little bit about that, why you feel that's the case? Yeah, I, th I think I've, I've often thought this, and it's not necessarily because I'm a woman. It's because I've changed a job more than traditional, more than traditionally. I don't. I mean, that's normal now. But when I think about my parents' generation, you started work. Usually, in those days, it was the man. More often, the woman stayed at home or went into part-time work or worked and took a career break for children. Um, so it was much more likely in the past that a man would start work and continue through, get all the NIC payments and benefit from full state pension. For women, that was much less likely from a state perspective. Also from a, a private pension perspective, if you're moving job fairly frequently, as people tend to now, as in mob mobility and so on, um, you're leaving pension pots behind you. And, I mean, that's another big area that you perhaps don't want to open up today, but I, I've been waiting for some kind of provision whereby you can either consolidate those pension pots at low cost, which you can't at the moment, it's very costly, or um, somehow you carry it with you. I think there's scope there for some innovative, creative thinking, which to me just hasn't happened in, certainly in my working career. Um, and, well, back to women. So, so women... Uh, career breaks for children and so on, they have a more erratic period of NIC's payments and therefore they're, un, in my view, um, punished, possibly too strong a word, but um, less likely to benefit from full state pension on retirement. And I think the facts, figures bear that out, that there are more women in po re retirement poverty than men. Talk about the Melbourne Mercer Global Pension Index, which I freely confess is not a, an index I was aware of before I read your paper. You say that it scores the UK a C plus alongside Chile, while smaller nations such as Denmark, Netherlands, Australia, Sweden, and Switzerland are ranked above with A or B a ratings. Can you tell us what what does this mean in practical effect? It just means the state pension provision by government in the UK is uh, much farther down the list than you know anyone who doesn't sort of pick up these things and sort of pay attention to them is aware of, in my view. The, the, the debate in the news and the press and so on is very much about pensions crisis and so on, but no one has actually said what we have is 
actually really quite far down the list on several of these rankings. The OECD one's the most recent one to come out, um, to my knowledge, that is. Um, so it, it's not, you know, we all go, oh, your pension's at risk if people vote yes. We're seeing a lot of that in the the campaigning that I've been seeing going on. Put our pensions at risk, no thanks, one poster I saw. And I thought, but actually, your pension's A, not that good at the moment. And secondly, who's to say it's not at risk as it stands? You know, the country's up to its neck in debt. So for me, the message that somehow UK pensions are safe, cosy, secure, it, it, for me, that's a, a, a bit of a fallacy. In a nutshell, Denmark, Netherlands, Australia, Sweden, Switzerland pay their pensioners a better pension than you pay them. On the whole, these countries per capita are wealthier than us. Luxembourg in particular, where I have personal experience of working. So being, you know, being small is is not for me. It's an advantage. It's not a, 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 a it's not something to be scared of. You can be small and wealthy, as a lot of the indicators show. Most of the wealthy nations in the Europe, anyway, are the small ones. The same correlation in the OECD uh, uh, index or study. You know, the, yes, the, I think the, I think the OECD one puts us. Well, it's it's more international than just mm. Europe. Um, but we, we come just above Mexico in that ranking. And you see we're the lowest uh, uh, in Europe uh, in your paper. Um, I think that's true, and that's based on the OECD mm -hmm. ranking. And it's the same correlation. The, the countries ahead of us tend to be more prosperous. It, could you repeat that? The, the countries ahead tend to be more prosperous. Is um, yeah, well, I think that's true, and perhaps that goes back to Jean's thing. Is it because they're somehow placing greater emphasis on pensions and cutting back on health? That may be the case. I'm, I've not done a, uh, an empirical analysis of that with uh, analysing the different variables, but it, it stands to reason that if you have more wealth in your nation, uh, more wealth per GDP, which is the measure I tend to use, um, then surely you have more wealth to dispose of in terms of state pensions. And I'm not, I'm to, not share, to share could be another way of Or to statement. share, well, absolutely. And it's not, you know, my argument isn't necessarily increase state pension immediately and in, in an independent Scotland we could. And that's for this committee and for parliamentarians and electorate to decide. Uh, but what I'm saying is it's not, it, it certainly, in my view, would be no worse and certainly we would have sort of the powers to do something better or different that suits our risk profile, our age, demographic, and so on. Thank you. Okay, Gavin, to be followed by John. Thank you. Um, let me just quote something from your paper. Um, Scotland could in time consider the attractiveness or otherwise of policies of other countries. For example, offering tax relief on work and private pension contributions based on age. Can you ex just expand on that a bit? Who would, who would get um, greater tax relief, younger people or older people? I'm not making a view on that. Uh, it's up to the Parliament to decide that, but what I'm saying is you could consider topics such as that. You wouldn't have to be stuck with what we've got at the moment. You could look round and make, as I said earlier, it's a chance for positive rethink, if that's what you want, uh, to look at what other countries do and consider what other countries' policies are. At the moment, this parliament, you, have absolutely no capacity to do that. So for me, it's an opportunity. Age could be you give older people more tax relief as they're approaching retirement, boost their fund, or you could it be, use it to encourage the younger ones uh, to invest more early. You could use it how you wanted. But it's, it's just an example, I'll put that in, it's just an example of something you, you might want to consider. Yeah, but clearly you've given it some consideration, and so which one would you advocate? I have no view on that at the moment. I, I've not done a full detailed study of the economic modelling surround, like surrounding that. I can see advantages for encouraging young people who tend not to save very much, partly because they tend to be on lower incomes when you're young, don't have as much disposable income. Um, having said that, I tell all my students start saving now because you get the benefit of um, uh, um, compound interest or compound growth of your fund if you start earlier and it grows much faster over long, it grows over a longer period. It's much more powerful. Uh, but you could argue that as people are approaching retirement, they need to have more of their income freed up, um, and you could allocate your your age-related relief 
to them more. It, 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 it's, it's an idea. It's a, a, a positive thing that, that you could consider. My point is you can't just now. Well, this group can't. This parliament can't. Um, you described the recent changes, um, I don't know if they were your words or you were quoting them from elsewhere, as, as the Lamborghini reforms. Um, you were pretty negative. Or I got the impression you were pretty negative about those reforms. I asked the, the First Minister at First Minister's questions which of those reforms he would reverse, and he didn't suggest that he would reverse any of them. Would you reverse all of them? Which ones? All, every single reform in the last finance well, bill? Well, or well basically, would, would I suppose the one, the one you touched on most was the fact that you don't have to purchase uh, an annuity, and I think you described mm -hmm. it, or you, you were quoting someone else, but you, you inferred that you felt that was a little reckless. Would you reverse that policy? First of all, I didn't use the word reckless. That was um, by the Pension Fund Institute or the OE it was the OECD um, head of pensions. Um, would I reverse that policy? Personally, my view would be I would favour a government that did reverse it. Personally, but that's not... I, I don't have the power to make those decisions. So um, I do think that it's a contentious one. And in my feeling is it's been done to appease um, the better off who have other pension provision who are from other sources uh, and they can get their lump sum, do their world cruise, buy their Lamborghini um, if they want. Uh, for me, given the crisis we've all been talking about, um, I'm not quite sure that's a helpful reform. If, if we were to become independent, you'd want to see, you wouldn't want to see that mirrored in an independent Scotland? I could see room for it. I could see it being an equitable and sensible thing to remove that one, the, the, the ability to cash your lump sum in now. And I think the people that will perhaps disgruntle are the better off, and that's okay, um, but it might be beneficial for the country to have a, an annuitised income stream going forward uh, so that people can't just spend all their pension now and leave themselves with nothing later on. I'm sure there's many people who are sensible with their money. I'm sure there's, there are many wealthy individuals who are very sensible and will manage that without a problem. But for me, there's two issues. There will inevitably be some people who don't manage that. And secondly, um, the future governments, future um, elected governments, will not have that income stream coming forward. Um, again, you were pretty critical about the... Um, decision whether I forget whether it was 1997 or 1998, but you described it as the, the pension raid, and you said that hasn't been revoked or reversed uh, by any UK government subsequent. Um, if we were to become independent, would you be calling on an independent Scotland to reverse that decision? I might. I might consider that to be helpful to pension savers, but it would have to be in the raft of other policy decisions as well. We would need to have other reviews of other aspects of pension provision. So it wouldn't just be take that away, take that away. We've been talking about a range of possibilities here today that could be part of the mix. Again, I'm not a campaigner for, I don't campaign to uh, MSPs telling them what I think they should do with their pensions. I give a personal view of what, I guess, if it's what you're asking me, if I was in power, um, what would I vote for and so on. Um, I, I do criticise the raid on pensions. I think that's been heavily criticised. It's not my words to use raid. That's been used by other people vociferously by many. Um, it seems to me if you want to help people have a better pension pot from their private pension, you could relieve them of that tax. Now, ta you know, you can tax them or give them relief in other ways, as has been happening. Um, and you could decide to do that if you were Parliament, yes, you could. Um, the other one you suggested was a, you want to see a redistribution between richer and poorer. Um, via tax relief on pensions. Um, again, is there, is there any indication, um, either in the white paper or elsewhere, that that is on the table at the moment? Um, I, I'm not, and I, I don't 
I don't think so. Um, perhaps you can correct me. I'm not an advocate. I'm not here as an advocate for the white paper particularly. Um, for me, for someone who can afford to put £40,000 into a pension fund annually and get tax relief at the higher rate, uh, for me, and that you know, for for me that seems that seems quite generous to better off people. I consider myself to be well off. I am above average earning, or earnings as a lecturer in Napier, but there's absolutely nothing I can do in terms of putting anywhere near that amount of money into pension pot annually. So my question then is, who, who is this constituency group who have the money to be able to put £40,000 into their pension pot? And why are they, if they're, if they're so wealthy, why are they getting full relief on that at 40%? Or more, or it would be forty percent. So for for me, that to me personally seems somewhat overly beneficial to better off in society. And finally, if I may, Convener, just the obviously the Scottish government produced their pensions paper entitled uh, "Pensions in an Independent Scotland," one hundred and nine pages, produced at the tail end of last year. Is there anything in that paper that you think will make private pensions in Scotland better than when being independent uh, than they are currently? Well, my understanding from the white paper pensions provision is that um, we inherit a system. There's going to be a bit of negotiation, a fair amount of transition, sorting out what goes where. And as I said earlier, I don't see the need for a massive overhaul immediately. But what I do see is the benefit of this parliament, yourself, having the power to do things according to what you think is better for the Sc Scotland's pensions and what's better for the Scottish people. At the moment, you have no power over that just now. You're happy for that to rest in London. Um, I'm arguing that I think you should have the power to have a say on that and be able to do something differently. You perhaps have your own views of what you would do differently than what um, your colleagues in London are, are doing just now. Um, it's not my job here today to ask you what they would be. But if you had the power here, I guess my question is, and um, obviously you don't have to answer me, is what, what, what would you do in Scotland if you had the power over that? Uh -huh pensions expert giving evidence in, in front of the committee. But let, let me close just with one question, because I'm just, you know, there is the hint being put forward, I think, that you think we would be better as an independent Scotland with pensions. No, that, that's, that's, that, that's nothing I've said. I, I'm, saying, I'm saying we could tailor our policies towards what we need. There's an opportunity to do something different we, you could do exactly what they're doing in Westminster if you want, if that makes sense to do so. And I'm not criticising everything Westminster's done. I'm, I think auto enrolment's a great idea. We, we could do that as well. It, just because we take power here doesn't mean you somehow stop doing what, what's good about the current system. And I think this dichotomy between if you think power should rest here somehow means everything down there is bad is wrong. What it does give you is the power to keep what's good, but also do something differently as the need requires, whether that's about immigration with the age thing or keeping younger people in the country and so on. To me, that seems to be more beneficial than having to accept a one-size-fits-all policy that's coming out of Westminster. OK, I'll, I'll close with one question. Though. Just a return to the paper. The, I mean, you know, you, you're saying we might be able to do things better or we might be able to do things differently. In, in the published paper from the Scottish Government, which was a pretty comprehensive paper on pensions only, is there anything in there that, in your view, as a pensions expert, um, will make Scotland better for private pensions? Well, there is, because we would be able to perhaps do things that suit the people of Scotland in terms of their private pensions. You can adjust tax rates, but only if you have the fiscal power to do so. Now, my view, as I've said today, is more egalitarian redistribution, but that might not be the will of the Scottish people. But as it happens, you, you can't do anything just now. So, yes, I do think there's things in the white paper that are going to help private pensions, because it will be this parliament that addresses that. And you can 
choose what's best, and presumably acting in the interests of the people who live here, not 50 million people who happen to live elsewhere with different economic, different demographics, different risk profile. I'm sorry to press, but you said there are things in there that well, make, would make a bit of what? In principle, if you have power to change things, you can presumably do things for the better. So the broad principle of the white paper, forgive me, is that this parliament should have powers over these things. So whatever the detail is, the thing you've got to remember is the white papers for uh, presuming this is what a government, if it was an SNP government, would do. Who knows? It might even be a Conservative government or a coalition. It might be a Labour government. You would have the powers to do something then. So that is the SNP's vision of what they would do were they elected. Now, again, I'd be delighted to hear the views of the non-SNP parties as to what their pension provisions would be should Scotland vote yes. I haven't heard anything on that yet. I, I have asked that question before. But other than the, the broad generality, are there any, I'm not talking about the white paper here, I'm talking about the specific pensions in an independent Scotland. As a pensions expert, are there any specifics within that paper that will make pensions in Scotland superior to pensions in the rest of the UK. I can't claim to say there's specific items. Which paper are you talking about? The white paper or the, pensions in it, independent it, Scotland? It's pensions in an independent Scotland, published September 2013. 109 pages. There are, in terms of the fact you will have powers to do what you need to do. Are there any specifics in that? As a pensions expert, you must be familiar with that paper. Are there any specifics in that paper? The word pensions expert is the words you're using. That was never words I've used myself. So you can push me on that, but that's your description. And I, you know, I come here with my personal knowledge, my work experience, the studies I do in my work. But my argument to you is, what, what would you do in a yes vote if you could choose to do what you want? No, no, I don't, I don't think we're... I, mean, I don't, I would, I don't want to... By simply saying, I'd rather not go into the detail of that paper now because I haven't read it for a while, for first of all. OK. Thank you. We'll leave it there. OK, then. Uh, let's move on. John, uh, to be followed by Michael. Hey, thank you, uh, convener. Um, you, you refer to the OECD and the fact that the UK um, pension provision at the moment, the average person might receive 32.6% of their final salary and, like Austria, would have 76.6%. Um, I mean, I'm just wondering, is there a right answer in there as to, is there a kind of agreed figure that we should all be aiming at, like 50% or two-thirds, or is there not? I don't think so. I think each country's unique and has its own electorate, what they are happy to vote for, are prepared not to vote for. Um, I think, to be honest, I've never thought that they're thought about having a, a magic figure that is one percentage of your salary should be your pension. I, I do know that living off the state pension in this country, I, I think many people would find that very hard if that was your only provision. But um, there are many people who do so. I mean, presumably 32.6% if you're a millionaire is okay, you can live on that. But even 76.6% if you've been on the minimum would actually not be enough to live on. So it, it would vary. Yes, it does vary. Right? Yes. Um, I guess you, you would have to look at um, figures for living wage and, you know, there's an argument going on around that just now. What do you actually need? Minimum wage isn't cutting it now. That's why we're seeing food banks and so on. So I'm not in a position to put a figure on what the magic number percentage of income you should be retiring on. Some people won't, won't need more, others don't. But I guess the, the, the two-pronged approach of um, those that can save should be saving and a uh, fallback state pension there, you know, for a sort of catch-all for everyone is, is a valid one. Uh, the, the figures we've been looking at in terms of Mercer and the OECD, the OECD figures are to do state pensions uh, provision. And my, my only point is that we shouldn't be we, we shouldn't be sitting here thinking we're Great Britain, we've got this fantastic pension. We, we, we just don't, and there's reasons for that. Um, but, you know, to 
I, I don't see from the, the, the figures we've read and the report from Bell and so on, I don't see why Scotland would be dramatically that much different. Yeah, there's slight differences in age and we've talked about some of the indicators of taxes paid and so on, but I, I don't see why we can't do it when other countries can. Yeah. Uh, that, that was going to be I was interested in as to well, what, what's wrong with the present system and presumably if, if we stayed in the UK then we can try and make the UK system better as well uh, albeit uh, we don't have a huge amount of influence but um, I mean we, we've talked a little about how the richer people seem to be getting quite a lot of benefits by way of tax what, what can we do at the bottom end I mean you've, you've mentioned the living wage and the minimum wage I mean presumably if somebody's in the minimum wage they cannot possibly save really even the living wage, as I understand it, I mean, that's what somebody needs to live on. So presumably we're also saying that on the living wage, people cannot save. No, so presumably, am I right in saying, would you argue then that we need to in increase the minimum wages in order that everybody could actually save? I haven't actually thought about that question before. Um, I think it's even for people, er, young, I mentioned young people earlier, if you're earning... <coughs> I don't know, just think from my own experience when I started out, um, Ernst and Young in 1990, um, I think my salary was £9,250, <laughs> which I thought was quite good at that time. Um, but I certainly didn't save. I didn't have much left over after all the bills were paid. So I would argue even... If you, I, I, know what I'm, I know what salary I'm on, sort of university lecturer salary. Um, that's well above average. Um, even people well above the minimum wage and the living wage, I, 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 I would be surprised if they can say very much, to be honest, as it stands. So I'm not even sure if raising, raising the win, minimum wage might, might be a good argument and it might be morally the right thing to do. I'm not sure it will have much impact on pension savings, but I'm basing that on supposition and I've not done any empirical studies on that. But the other thing is just to accept that not everybody is going to have a funded pension, you know, at some stage. I mean, we've got this mix at the moment. I think you've argued that other countries have more of their pension provision is funded. But, I mean, it seems to me that we're never going to get to the stage where 100% of people are funded. Um, I mean, should we be relaxed about that as to how much is funded and how much is not funded? Just accept that for a, quite a large chunk of the population... You know, it is our duty today to pay for today's pensioners. Just, just to clarify something, when you're looking across Europe, um, I think what I said was that the UK has more bigger percentage of people with funded pensions, private pensions, than this. Uh, but the state one is falling down. Um, which, just as a slight aside, you, does make you think. If you've got a funded pension, you're inevitably going to be in the better off group. So that does lead you to the next thing. Well, what are our responsibilities to retired people, um, the aged and so on, without who haven't had the wealth to invest in a private pension fund and get tax relief at 40, 50 percent at 40 grand a year, whatever the, you know, the changing rates are. Um, so, uh, you know, we're back to equality. We're back to your views or the public's views, the electorate's views on equality and distribution of wealth. Um, I, I've never described myself as socialist in my life. Um, I think many people know that. But equally, I do believe that you have a, a moral obligation to people, and the poor and the weak and the vulnerable, and that's just personal view. Um, so I, I think to fund state pensions at, at, at something that's sensible is, is something I would obviously agree with and continue to agree with. On the, on the personal pension, I mean, you've mentioned the point about the admin costs that, I mean, my father also worked for an, one employer all his life, so presumably the admin costs of his pension were fairly straightforward, whereas a lot of us, myself and younger, have got various pots around the place. Does that mean that the admin costs tend to eat into these things? Yeah. But pri private pension. Yes, uh -huh. if I've got three or four. Yeah, if you've got three or four pots, as, as I have, because I've worked in industry um, eight years in one employer, I've worked in Luxembourg as well, um, I've worked for financial, major financial institutions in, the UK, in, in Scotland, um, and yes, I have several pension pots as well, and it, it, this, is, this is something that's just occurred to me from my personal experience, that it, I, I don't like having different pots, I'd rather consolidate them, it seems to me to make a bit more sense. 
economically, but the charges are severe when you move your money. And I, I don't actually think there's been a huge amount done to address that. And it means you will be taking small amounts of stream from different pots, each one taking management charges, trustee charges, custody charges. Um, it, it's not, it, it can be very expensive, as we know from the discussion around pension fund charges that's been going on in the last few years. Um, it's, that's not helpful in my view. I, I would love to see a provision whereby you could consolidate your pots without being hammered for it through charges. You suggested that the Dutch have a model where they, they kind of pool a bit more instead of just all individual pots. Is that, is that something you're aware of or can comment on? I'm not an expert on that, but I would certainly be interested in that being looked at um, as a future of private pensions. I think that would be very helpful for an awful lot of people. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. You know, um, yesterday at the Welfare Reform Committee, the chair of the expert group which was set up to look at welfare change said that you can't transplant um, different systems from other countries uh, into to Scotland, that Scotland would have to have its own system, uh, would have to develop its own system and there would be huge transition periods, transition costs involved in doing that. Obviously there would be some benefits as well in doing that, uh, but he said that it was not appropriate to transplant um, from one country to another because Scotland already has a particular system. We have a different culture. We have, you know, we are not the same as other countries. So we're not starting from a blank slate. We are starting from where we are, and where we are at the moment, you know, you can, you know, look at it. You can analyse it. You can assess it. You can find fault with it, or you can approve it. But companies, private companies, who are involved in that market, especially in pensions like Standard Life. You know, it's got £240 billion of assets under management. Um, in looking at the, the potential for an independent Scotland, they have put in place a contingency to put parts of their operations outside of Scotland because of that uncertainty. So while we might look towards an independent Scotland and say, we could do this or we could do that, if we were starting from a blank sheet, that might be possible, but we're not. If there was change, there would be an impact on that change. Standard Life moving its assets to headquarters in, in parts of uh, the rest of the UK would have an impact on GDP. So the, the question I've got for you is, starting from where we are, do you see the risks involved in affecting the, the current uh, pensions arrangements? And what are those risks? You mentioned the welfare committee there, and you yeah. can't. This is. I, I thought perhaps your question was to do about welfare for no, a start. Yeah, general term because they're involved. They were talking about the, the demographic changes, and the demographic changes affect pensions as well. Welfare provision is, is impacted by people's, um, you know, income, whether that's in retirement or working age or whatever. So all of these things have to be taken into consideration. It was just a quote from the, the chair of the expert group, an expert looking at. Uh, welfare um, implications for a, an independent Scotland said that it's, it is not possible to look elsewhere for a model and then transplant that model into Scotland because we're not starting from scratch. I don't believe we are starting from scratch either. I agree with you there. Um, I believe we're inheriting a situation, as you said, that is as it is. And what we've got to do is take that and work with it, either keep what we want, keep all of it if we want, but change what we want to as well, as a normal government tends to do. So, yeah, I agree with you. We're not ripping up. We're not, we're, it's not like a, a ground zero or a complete starting point from a blank sheet. What we do have is a possibility to change things in a way that suits uh, the people that live in this part of the country, this country, rather. Um, so, yeah, you refer to standard life there. Um, I seem to remember the same thing being said and done by Scottish widows um, before devolution 1997. Mike Ross, I believe, wrote a very large two-page spread in The Scotsman, to which I responded. Uh, he said it would be damaging to his business and uh, jobs would go. Not one job went. And I worked for them for several years as well since devolution. They, they've gone... 
Uh, well, we kept the same structures. We kept everything in place. We, we changed some powers. You're talking about independence, starting uh, a new country with a exactly. new system separate from what we currently have. So why do we believe them when they talk about a small, a small change like devolution? Why, why would we believe them when they say it about something so small? Why would we believe that now? That's the first thing. The second thing here is, is my experience business, um, um, Standard Life. I've never worked for them, but I've worked for very similar companies, Lloyds, TSB, Scottish Widows, State Street, Bank and Trust Company, JP Morgan, Chase Manhattan, as it was before. Um, and there's no way, if there's a yes vote on September the 18th, they are going to have the packing crates round moving out. First of all, where, where are they going to have their building to accommodate the 3,000 people or that they employ there? Well, what, they're, not, they're moving their headquarters, they just need an office. Well, she was asked my question. It's a... Rhetorical. <laughs> <laughs> or you can answer in a minute. That's that aspect of it. Secondly, I know some of the fund managers at Standard Life, they've come up from England. Why are they here? They're here because they like the lifestyle here. They like sauntering across the meadows on their way to work. They don't want to go to Basingstoke now with their families, kids at school here. That's the second thing. Where are Standard Life going to get all the expertise they've built up if they're going to upship? My last question is, why would they? What advantage is there? What is it they're running away from or escaping? Just to put this in context, if you look at the notes in the accounts where... I think where you've picked up on this, Standard Life made their big thing. Um, it, it, it's a few lines like that. And they're just saying they're, of course, serve the interests of the shareholders, no matter what happens, whatever government. And that. It costs about £100 to set up a new company, a shell company. I can set up a company in London now, registered in England. It costs me £100. It's not a significant investment for them to say, we've set up companies in England. You can set up a legal entity for a few quid. Uh, so I'm not actually sure why everyone's going, oh, they've started moving. They haven't. And as with Scottish widows, I don't believe they will move because there's no reason for them to. So if you look at the board and the person who said those comments, if you look at their affiliations, who they've advised, David Cameron, you will find that we're not exactly talking someone who is utterly impartial. So has your current business looked at um, moving... Uh, all right, so well, since you were a member of Business for Scotland, I assume that you had a business? No. No? Also, was it, is it academics for, for independence that you're in there? I'm in both. So, so yeah. you advise people in, in terms of promoting independence? But it's not... But it's questionable for, for Standard well, Life or someone at Standard no, would, Life to advise the, the, the if, you, if you're questioning Prime my Minister. credentials, because no, I I'm actually not work for you university you, now. That you were the one who said that the person at Standard Life, we should look at their credentials and who they've advised. Well, well I would just argue that I, I'm not saying I'm impartial. I'm just giving you a, my own views and using my experience in business over 20 years. You can take that if you want. I'm not. You can accept that or not. It's entirely up to you. That uh, brings to a conclusion our questions. Uh, thank you very much for giving evidence to the Finance Committee uh, this morning. Uh, I'm going to suspend um, for five minutes just to give members a natural break and stretch their legs. <coughs>
Folks, we'll just start off in a, in a wee minute or so, so. Right, uh, we will now continue our consideration of Scotland's public finances post-2014 by taking evidence from Professors uh, David Heald and uh, Alan Trench. So I'd like to welcome you both uh, to the committee. Again, uh, members have copies of written evidence provided by witnesses, so we will go straight to questions. Now, as uh, normally happens in the Finance Committee, uh, I will start with some questions and then I will move on to uh, members of the committee to also um, ask questions. Now, what I'm going to do is, I think, uh, rather than jump about from paper to paper, as I normally do, I think this time what I'll do is, uh, Professor Heald, I'll take some questions, I'll put some questions to yourself. But, uh, Professor Trench, you can comment as well, so you can have a wee bit of interaction. Um, that's that's worked pretty well up to do, uh, up to now. We have had um, one session that lasted three and a half hours. We'll try to ensure that doesn't <laughs> happen today. You'll be glad to know. <laughs> um, so, um, um, but uh, we'll we'll get to, uh, uh, straight to it. And of course, uh, colleagues will, will come in as well. So, first of all, then, Professor Heald. Um, in paragraph two of your own uh, submission, you say that, uh, and I quote, expectation have been aroused inside Scotland for a better devolution deal. Well, temporarily, in my view, the voices outside Scotland that denounce its excessive privileges are relatively subdued. Is that, you believe, a, a temporary phenomenon that will re-emerge post-September? One of the things that surprised me since devolution uh, is that the kind of criticism of Scotland's position has, been, has, has always been there but it's never re really reached a peak. Um, people kind of focus on the identifiable expenditure figures published annually by the Treasury, and they also blame Barnett formula for the position of the North England within, within England, whereas it's completely irrelevant to the position of the North of England. It's gone pretty quiet at the moment, uh, but I think you'll find that after the referendum, if the answer is no, it will, it will actually, re will actually re-emerge. And I think there's a kind of code language which you see in some of the evidence that's been submitted to this committee, that when people talk about the reform of the Barnett formula, it usually means that Scotland should get less public spending. Uh, and one of the things which I was very critical of during the previous Labour government was that when there was plenty of money around, uh, when vast quantities of money were coming down the Barnett pipeline, there were proposals that I made with Alistair MacLeod about how you could actually alter the Barnett formula in a way which would satisfy uh, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, that was not done. And basically the Labour government just suspended, j just froze all debate about the, future, about the future of Barnett. So I think, yes, I think we're at a critical... If the answer is no, I think we're at a critical juncture. Critical juncture. And you know, the, the kind of Gerald Holtum's... Uh, Holtham Commission inquiry was relatively mild in its language, but there's a paper by him and another member, David Miles, in the Financial Times, that suggests Scotland should lose £4 billion. Uh, I would expect a lot more articles like that in future. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a very large um, question, set of questions. Um, there's a question of how the Barnett formula works, on which David is probably the greatest expert. Um, there's a question of the political pressures that um, exist in England and in other parts of the United Kingdom, particularly Wales, for reform of the Barnett formula. Um, and there's a question of what's, of what's likely to happen post-referendum. Um, to take that last, um, because it's, I think it's probably the most pertinent, the, there's certainly a concern out with Scotland about the level of funding that Scotland gets, and it is, frankly, quite hard to justify. Um, if, if your criteria are based on things like relative need. Um, that said, I see, somewhat regrettably, I have to say, no sign that anything very, is, very dramatic is likely to happen. Um, we have explicit commitments in... From both Conservative and Liberal, uh, from both Labour and Liberal Democrat parties, in their papers setting out options for further devolution, saying there shouldn't be any change to the Barnett formula. The Conservatives um, have taken a similar position in relation in, in the press conference. They're not in the Strathclyde Commission report. Um, there have been repeated assurances by the Prime Minister and various other UK ministers, including the Chancellor, that there's going to be no change until the public finances are stabilised, which. Um, would appear to be some way off. Um, so at some point, there may, when, when public finances can be deemed to have been stabilised, 
um, that, that on that basis there may be an issue. But the pre that there really isn't any clear indication of any likely change, despite significant political concerns, I say, um, in parts of England and particularly in Wales about the present arrangement. I mean, as I said on 12th of March 2012, and I quote, I do think that there will be a review of Barna after 2014. And, uh, you know, um, basically, uh, Arthur Carmichael said on the 27th of November last year that... Uh, Barnett's future will depend on the outcome of the 2015 general election, so that's moving away from the referendum, but there certainly are murmurings, are there not? There, 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 are, there are many murmurings. Um, I, um, I advised a House of Lords Select Committee that reported in 2009 and recommended a different approach, essentially a needs-based approach, um, to, do, to, to funding through the block grant. Um, there's, there, there are a large number of murmurings, but there's, there's no sign that that's actually anyone's official policy. That it was Lib Dem policy going into the last election? It, well, it isn't anymore, it would seem, if you look at the uh, the Campbell Commission report. Mm, okay. I'm sure that'll be explored further as we go on. But I want to go back to yourself, Professor Heald, in terms of uh, your own paper. When you, in paragraph 6, you say the Treasury has unchallenged power. And then in paragraph 7, you say there's a transparency deficit that is undesirable now and unless removed would make major devolved taxes unworkable. I'm just wondering if you can uh, explain that to us. The reason why there's been less controversy about Barnet since devolution is that in the 2000s, there was just vast amounts of money coming through Barnet. Uh, in my view, too much money coming uh, because Scott, Scott, the devolved administrations couldn't actually absorb uh, the amount of consequences, consequentials that were coming from health and education in England. Uh, so the fact that because there was plenty of cash, people didn't pay much attention, pay, people didn't pay much attention uh, to the Treasury control of it. Um, the Treasury, broadly in my view, has actually followed the rules in the Statement of Funding Policies that's issued at the times of most um, spending reviews. But the point is that the document, the, the, what actually happens in the operation of Barnet is not actually put in the public domain. Uh, the data that I give you in my memorandum is a result of a whole series of uh, freedom of information requests to the Scottish Government about tracking the evolution of Barnet. And you'll see from that table, Barnet is only actually part of the picture. The point is Barnet is deeply embedded in the UK public, UK public expenditure system, which the Treasury, Treasury controls. And the reason for the quotation, the paragraph you gave me, is that in a period where until 2010 there was actually lots of money around, uh, less focus. But it, if the fin Scottish Finance Minister Secretary has got to stand up and, and, and propose um, a, a, a Scottish income tax, uh, for example, higher than the 10p, uh, which is the Kalman tax, which is the Kalman deduction, um, you've got to have an absolute clarity that the Treasury cannot make offsetting changes. Now, there was a logic during the 2000s of Scotland actually using the tartan tax in a negative direction uh, because, the, because the money was unabsorbable and it built up in end year flexibility. But the point is, all the, all the political advice received by ministers was not to do that, simply because the system was not transparent and the Treasury had plenty of levers whereby it could actually, uh, actually punish Scotland uh, for actually using the tartan tax in a negative direction. So if you've, got, if, if, the, if you've got the tax powers and the tax powers have become more significant um, and at least as significant in the sense that you have to have a tax resolution now, it's absolutely fundamental that all the numbers concerning the operation of Barnet are immediately put in the public domain. And it doesn't require academics to subsequently dig them out through freedom of information requests. Ten, you know that a precondition of the exercise of significant tax powers is that there is full transparency about the funding system, otherwise the tax powers will become unusable, subject to mockery, vulnerable to gaming by the UK government and to disintegration of the administrative infrastructure for assessment and collection. And you go on in the following paragraph 11 to say, uh, raising own revenues in quotes cannot legitimately mean receiving the revenues generated in a sub-national jurisdiction through the application of a centrally set tax rate to a centrally prescribed tax base. This creates no political accountability. They are assigned revenues, even if not labelled as such. Yes, I mean, as I made 
clear in the first paragraph. I've got a long record of being in favour of devolved taxes, and I still am. But the point, the point I keep making is the devolved taxes have got to be usable. I don't see any point in having devolved taxes. I don't even admit their description as devolved taxes if the system within which they operate makes them actually, makes them actually unusable. So, for example, in the context of, context of Kalman, uh, the, the Scottish Government, the Finance Minister, has got to notify HMRC by the 30th of November uh, of the previous, previous year of what the Kalman tax rate would be. Um, that isn't actually publishing it, but I just cannot believe that can remain, um, remain, remain secret. But given the UK budget, it's not till end of March, beginning of April, and how much money you get from the tax... And the, and, the budget, and the actual consequences on households depends on UK decisions in the March-April budget, um, the tax power will become difficult to use. So one of the points I make at the end of the memorandum is if fiscal devolution is going to work, initially for Scotland and possibly also for Northern Ireland and Wales later, it requires big changes at the UK level. So there, there's, a, there's, an, there's a paradox. Uh, if the answer is no and there is more extensive devolution, particularly more extensive fiscal devolution, it's actually, ironically, Westminster and Whitehall that have got to change the most. And are you saying that's likely to happen? Um, I spent 21 years as the specialist advisor to the Treasury Committee of the House of Commons. The whole experience left me pretty depressed about Westminster and Whitehall. Um, I think there, there, is, there is a kind of fundamental problem in the UK that though I do believe you need strong finance ministries, the Treasury and the Chancellor of the Exchequer basically dominate UK, UK, fiscal, UK fiscal affairs. Westminster is pretty marginal, uh, pretty marginal to that. So it requires a recognition by Westminster and by the UK government that to actually have fiscal devolution in significant income tax powers, whether that be Kalman or whether it means the whole of income tax or, or, or some kind of compromise on that. There has to be a basis for which the Scottish Government uh, or the Wales Government, the Northern Ireland Assembly Government can actually plan uh, their tax, to the use of their tax, tax powers without concern that subsequent UK changes will actually, subsequent changes to the tax system at the UK level will actually compromise, compromise um, the operation of the operation of the taxpayers. One of the things that one of the things that astonishes me uh, is that over a very short period, uh, we've moved from a position where about one but where about one million people pay the high rate of highest rate of income tax to a position whereby about about forty percent uh, uh, about about sort of one from one million to about four million pay uh, the higher rate. Now, you know, the, 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 the higher rate threshold, because of fiscal drag, now kicks out at a level of income that I do not regard as particularly high. So the, the interaction between decisions taken about decisions taken about the thresholds at which you start to pay income tax and the threshold at which you start to pay the higher rate are actually fundamentally important to the operation of anything other than a a complete devolution, complete devolution of income tax. Um, whether, whether Westminster and Whitehall can reform themselves, I don't know, uh, but I do think this is a critical juncture at which, um, w which the issue is going to be, surface much more in political debate. Just a sense about whether they can, it's whether there's a willingness. Do you think that's something that's um, possible I would certainly agree from my own, my own academic work and my own advising work that... Um, there has been a pretty broad reluctance within Whitehall, particularly, um, to embrace the sorts of changes that were necessary concomitants of devolution. That said, I think that the referendum debates have triggered much wider levels of thinking and reflection about this than there have been, and that the commitment of Conservative Lib Dem uh, Labour parties to significantly enhance forms of further devolution are going to have quite a significant effect. Um, one thing that's very clear about um, Whitehall's willingness to change is it depends, first and foremost, not on bureaucratic inertia but on political will. Um, we saw that quite dramatically in the debates around what became the Scotland Act 2012. 
um, that fairly attenuated proposals that have come from Labour in 2009 turned into much more far-reaching ones under the coalition in 2010 because of the sorts of lines that were taken by uh, ministers in the incoming government. Um, and I think that that's a process that is quite likely to be replicated, assuming a no vote, after September. Um, if I might, could I just say a couple of other things, for picking up on, on, on what Professor Heald was saying. I very largely agree with, my, with, with what he said, um, uh, in particular about um, um, the nature of the block grant process and budget constraints and how that will work with devolved tax powers. And I think there are both some big questions about that and some issues about transparency and data. Um, I think, though, that, that, that Professor Heald is more sanguine than I would be um, about how the Treasury have complied with the Barnett formula rules. Um, it's much easier to comply with the rules when you get a chance periodically to rewrite them. And that's an opportunity that the Treasury has and it has used. Um, the most dramatic example of that has been um, in relation to the 2012 London Olympics and the consequentials that should have flown from that, um, which was a decision made around the spending review in 2007. Um, and that's, there are blog posts on my blog, Devolution Matters, that detail this in great detail, and they'll be available. I'm glad to, I'll be happy to send details to, to the clerks if they want. We've, we've seen rewritings of classifications of public transport, largely in South East England, schemes like London Transport Crossrail, um, that have had the effect of, in that case, increasing the consequentials that were available to Scotland rather than reducing it. Um, which had been the case with the, the 2012 Olympics and business. Um, these are decisions that get taken in a rather hasty and rather untransparent manner at spending reviews when the Statement of Funding, form, uh, funding Policy, um, that document, the, the operations manual, which is the Barnett formula, one might call it, uh, gets written. And I think that that's a process that, that, has ba that badly needs review and has done for quite a long time. Could I, could I just... Just come back. Should I? The one point I forgot to make is, is that you know, I would disagree with my co-witness. I think that broadly uh, it has been followed. What I would draw the committee's attention to is, is the £607 million deduction from the previous year's spend to get, into the, to get into the SR 2013 baseline, which is table one of my yeah. memorandum. Now, there is no, as to the best of my knowledge, there is absolutely no provision anywhere for some Barnet consequentials to be regarded as temporary and hence reversible. Now, whereas, I mean, the, the, Olympic, the, the Olympics and the Carter Review of Prisons are actually mentioned in a, in, in a footnote. So it's a, really the difference between me and the, 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 my co-witness is really about leap, quite how you categorise them. Uh, but but given, the peer, given the period and what's been happening elsewhere in UK public finances over that period, I still stick to my judgment that broadly the rules are being followed. I am concerned about suddenly you get this new classification of Barnet consequentials being temporary and, or one-off, because I'd never heard that expression in the context of Barnet uh, consequentials, the distinction between permanent and temporary. That was new to me uh, when I got the numbers for the, what actually happened at Spending Review 2013. So I think this is, this is a good example of why we need more transparency at the time, not transparency when you actually get the numbers much later. So when, so, so when the decisions are taken, uh, with the Westminster Parliament and the Scottish Parliament should actually have the numbers to see what's actually happened. Just, uh, Professor Hilder, you said in uh, paragraph 9b of your uh, submission that uh, the expenditure-based financing system with broad expenditure switching powers is congruent with the reality of the UK public expenditure system. The 16% of the population living in the devolved administrations were sufficiently marginal to UK political debates for some spending legacies and policy deviancy to be tolerated at Westminster and Whitehall. Um, can you expand on what you, you mean by that? Well, I, th I think that the... Um, one of the points I make in the memorandum is that though some people call Barnett a needs formula, it isn't a needs formula, it's an adjustment, form, it's an adjustment formula. Uh, but contrary to some of the other evidence you've, you've received, there is a perfect rationale for the Barnett, for, for the Barnett formula. The, the, the freedom to spend of the Scottish ministers, how they spend, and the Parliament's own, pow own powers, crucially depend upon the block grant nature uh, of, of, of the spending system. If you, if you had a system which was built up 
in a disaggregated from a disaggregated needs assessment, you run very serious very serious dangers that you start getting more earmarking and, and, and ring fencing of particular particular kinds of uh, particular kinds of expenditure. Uh, it, that block grant nature and the fact that Westminster can't intervene, Whitehall can't intervene in the composition of Scottish spending, has allowed Scotland to follow its own policies. Um, um, it, 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 one obvious one is about um, higher education tuition fees, which, which are not liked, to put it mildly, uh, at Westminster and Whitehall, but because they were within a block system, the Treasury cannot, the Treasury cannot, ca ca cannot, cannot intervene. Um, the, other point, the other point is I also in my memorandum explain why the Treasury actually quite likes Barnet in a certain sense. What it means for the Treasury is it doesn't have to get involved in the detail of Scottish programmes. Because previous Secretaries of State for Scotland before devolution were actually quite skilful, before Barnet and before devolution, were quite skilful at getting quote, Scotland share and then running separate arguments about why Scotland needed more for various, various reasons. So from the Treasury point of view, it means if they concentrate on England, on the big English programmes, health, transport, law and order, justice, work out the, work out the, the spending for those departments, put that into the Barnet calculations and they get a number for the devolved for the three devolved administrations it avoids a lot of you know face-to-face -face negotiation about devolved policies in three jurisdictions about which they don't really know very much where they would be at a disadvantage so one of the other reasons why Barnet has survived is simply be, simply because there are practical advantages uh, to the practical advantages to the to the UK Treasury as well um, thank you. Um, I would certainly agree that um, that one of the attractions of Barnet is its practical advantages to the Treasury, as well, in, on a practical level, actually, to a devolved finance minister, including devolved finance ministers who don't do as well as the Scottish finance minister does from it, uh, because it gives you a stable and predictable revenue stream. Um, I would also particularly agree with um, Professor Hield's comment about disaggregated needs assessments. If you were to go down the route of something like the 1979 needs assessment, which was highly, highly detailed, not only is that a very time-consuming exercise, but because it makes a detailed assessment of needs in relation to roads and transport or health or other particular fields, that is very likely to lead to a de facto ring fencing. Um, one of the merits of the sort of approach outlined by uh, Gerald Holtham in his Commission's report is that it gets away from that because you're using a small number of high-level indicators which cut across service fields. So it again produces a block of money that, of which it's very hard for an individual devolved minister to say, this is my share, I require it. Um, it actually enables a wider cross-government decision to be made. Um, that said, um, I think there are w one of the problems with the present Barnett formula arrangement um, and I know this is a point on which Professor Hill disagrees with me, is that, in fact, I think there is a de facto um, link, an implicit link, between um, public policy in England and public policy for the devolved administrations. Um, that is less acute a problem for Scotland because of the relative generosity of the formula that means that there is quite a bit of room for manoeuvre within the present arrangement. It is much less so, much more strikingly so, particularly for Wales. But it applies here as well, because changes in the block grant, of course, can be reductions as well as increases. And if those follow changes that are made in the block grant um, because of changes in making, they will follow through. So the block grant for all three devolved administrations was reduced when the UK government decides that it's going to abolish the teaching grant for universities for humanities and social science subjects. So the non the, a large chunk of the existing teaching grant grows for what are called, now considered to be non-priority subjects. That feeds through into a reduction in the block grant for all three devolved governments, which increases the strain that, that, there, that is felt by pursuing different higher education policies. That's likely to be the case in the future. <coughs> and um, one has to point out that the effects of austerity, I mean, A, have not been hugely felt so far um, in spending terms. They've been overwhelmingly borne by the local government budget in England and therefore by consequential shares of that. Scotland and Wales, which are limited because of local taxation. But also, most particularly because of the way that, that the two largest devolved spending areas have been ring-fenced in England. 
health and school spending have both been ring-fenced within England. And if that were to cease to be the case after the next UK election, then again, that's likely to have consequences for um, devolved budgets. Professor Hield, you said today in paragraph uh, 13E, and I quote, the relationship between the devolved taxation system and social security is critical, both in terms of system functioning and political credibility. So I'm just wondering if you can expand on that for us, please. Um, this, one of the questions you've got to ask yourself about income tax, which I think is the, is the right tax in a devolved system, right major tax in a devolved system, is how far you can go with devolved control over, over rates uh, before you start worrying about the interaction with the, with the benefit system. Um, the tartan tax power, on the whole, people thought that that wasn't too, wasn't too uh, large. Uh, the Kelman tax uh, is superficially a bigger power than the tartan tax, though, though in practical terms it might not be, because political constraints probably put quite a narrow band on how you can change it. If, for, ex if, for example, you devolve the whole of income tax, um, you've then got a question about the relationship to national insurance contributions and income tax, and you've also got the, the question relationship, you, you've got the relationship between, between the kind of benefit system the social welfare benefit system and the, and the tax system. Uh, there is some some of the things that have happened in the last four or five years have led to some bizarre marginal rates of personal income tax at the UK level. Um, for example, in context of withdrawal of child benefit, and in, in terms of in, in terms of removal of a personal allowance at over a hundred thousand, and also in ter also in terms of pension contributions. So you've got certain spikes in the. You've got certain spikes in the income distribution. And you've also, got, you've also got the question of the relationship between sort of tax thresholds, tax rates, and universal credit. Um, the, 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 one of, the, the politically most visible sign of the kind of issues is obviously the, the so-called bedroom tax. So the, question, the, the question is, if, for example, the Scottish, the Scottish Parliament took over the whole of income tax, you have got into an area where you cannot neglect the issue between the interaction of the interaction of the income tax and the income tax rates and, and the benefit system. Otherwise you get lots of publicity about bizarre marginal rate structures where people are actually you know, losing a huge proportion of huge proportion of uh, additional uh, of additional income. The other point the other point I would make is that if you've got an income tax power, and this comes back to my fact point I made earlier, that it's the UK that has to change. Um, if income tax is devolved, but national insurance contributions are a UK, de are a UK, are a UK, de UK decision, um, you then get the question, is that the UK government cuts income tax in England, cuts income tax at the UK level, but puts up national insurance contributions at the UK level. So unless there's some kind of con functioning concordat between the UK government and the devolved governments. Uh, you can just imagine the kind of difficulties that you'll get into. Thank you. Professor Change. Um, well, um, there's certainly scope for an interaction. I don't think that those problems are by any means insuperable. Um, and I think that they in part come, apart, come about because of... Um, the, the, the difficulties that there have been in running a simplified tax system. Um, um, uh, we have a notoriously complicated tax system, perhaps not as bad as that in the United States, but it is um, nonetheless um, not particularly good. One of the things that informed the work for on Devo, the Funding Devo More paper was reading the Murley's Review, um, which was the very comprehensive attempt to assess what a simplified tax system looked like. Uh, carried out under the chairmanship of Sir James Murley's for the Institute of Fiscal Studies, and published what, 18 months, two years ago. Um, and there are ways. I, 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 there are ways to resolve all those issues. As, as, as Professor Hield says, they would require ensuring that you had some effective cl um, clarity of lines between the roles of these various functions um, and the roles of the respective governments. But that's perfectly suitable. Professor Trench, actually, in your paper, which, I, which starts off um, quite helpfully by saying I'm chiefly concerned with the implications of a no vote, so it's quite focused in that regard, you've said that um, 
Uh, you talk about VAT and you say retaining the receipts from uh, the tax would give the Scottish Government with a direct interest in ensuring economic growth and a way of reaping the fiscal rewards for doing so. That would help make a measure like universal childcare much more affordable and practical. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you can talk a bit more about the potential for assigning VAT revenues. Well, um, one of the things that one... The, 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 the work on funding Devo More started as an exercise to apply the lessons that can usefully be learned in a UK context and taking into account what would seem to be good fiscal and good tax and um, administrative practice from other, the many other federal and decentralised systems around the world, um, because I was profoundly unconvinced by people who said, we can't do that here, it's too difficult, as if the UK is, uh, the, and, the, and its arrangements and people are somehow um, less able to deal with these things than the Swiss, the Canadians, the Australians, the Germans, and so on. Um, the, one of the big problems one comes to is that if one's to try and ensure that there is a significant degree of responsibility in the hands of devolved government, um, there are a limited number of taxes with which one can do that. And several of them are not suited for devolution under any circumstances. Um, so there are significant difficulties with both employers and employees' national insurance contributions, for example. Um, and looking at VAT is attractive because um, devolving some form of sales tax is a very common um, approach used in federal systems. So countries like um, Canada and the United States... Um, routinely have sales taxes at the level of the sub-state government. And um, taxes um, and the receipts of taxes like VAT are very commonly used to fund um, state-level governments in countries like Germany and Australia. Now, EU rules mean that you have to have what, is, what the EU regards as a single VAT across your member state. The same rate of VAT has to prevail um, on a particular class of items. You, how you class items is a matter for national discretion. But um, the same rate has to prevail across the whole of the territory of the member state. So in an independent Scotland, you could quite happily set the, the, the rate of uh, uh, on um, domestic fuel lower than the 5% that it presently is, or higher, if you were so to wish. Um, and likewise, you could, for example, do something with... Um, the present zero rating of items like books or children's clothing. Um, or you could choose to reduce the headline rate or increase it. Th these are all decisions that are open to you. They're not open if you're trying to devise a decentralised tax structure within a continuing United Kingdom. Um, nonetheless, VAT is um, a very attractive tax to look at um, assigning the revenues of because it's a relatively stable tax in the short to medium term. By the standards of taxes, it's not particularly volatile. Some taxes are very volatile, some aren't. Income tax isn't very volatile. VAT isn't very volatile. Um, corporation tax is very volatile. Um, so that's one attraction. Um, it's also, over time, a growth tax. So it provides a secure rather than less secure um, basis for... Um, devolved funding, and it would be hard to imagine circumstances in which you wouldn't have a v you wouldn't want to have a sales or VAT, sales so tax or VAT of some sort. And indeed, it would obviously be a requirement uh, for an independent Scotland, in, in if it were to be a member of the European Union in any event. So, as well, this is a tax that you need to have, and you need to have at a certain level. And um, the receipts of it are a very useful um, piece, useful source of, of income. Now, assignment of taxes is generally regarded as um, a, an unattractive option to pursue, and there are some good reasons for that. Um, assignment involves an asymmetric, in particular, as assignment involves an asymmetric transfer of risk. It means that you bear the burdens of, fl of fluctuations in the revenues that are generated by the tax without the ability to use the rates or incidents of the tax um, as, a, as levers for stimulating economic behaviour or mitigating that revenue risk. In my view, that risk is more acceptable in relation to VAT than in relation to any other tax, principally because it's a relatively stable tax. And one of the advantages of its assignment is that you're able then to draw direct benefit from a successful economic policy. If you're able to use the other, the other levers regarding economic development, and quite a number are in devolved hands, 
Um, not all by any means, but quite a number are, including things like vocational education um, and um, financial assistance to industry, which could involve cash grants, site preparation, variety of options. Um, if you if if you choose if if you're able to use those to stimulate economic behaviour, that enables you to benefit the, to reap the benefit of that as well. So that strikes me as helping make that the, the asymmetry of that risk again significantly lower, and to create an incentive in securing prosperity, which is I think to everyone's benefit. Um, I'm deeply suspicious of our arguments about assignment because I think it confuses. I'm not saying assignment might not have some rule within a system, but if you want to get the accountability benefits, you've got to have taxes that people can actually change. Um, basically, basically what, you would do, what you will do with tax assignment is you get, the amount of rev you get the amount of revenue that follows from the UK government's decisions on the tax base and the tax rate. I'm dubious about these growth, effect, these growth effects, particularly with reference to something like, 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 v, like, like VAT. Um, the, you, you, become, you, you basically take the risk of... Re, the, you take the fiscal risks of revenues falling short, falling short without actually having the, having, the, having the policy levers. It also confuses the debate... Because you start getting arguments about what proportion of what proportion of funds are quote financed by the Scottish Parliament end quote, but, but if you, they're being financed by taxes which you've got no control over at all, I see no accountability benefits benef benefits. So the crucial point is you need taxes that you can actually do something about. Otherwise, you will end up with the Northern Ireland situation after the Government of Ireland Act 1920, where in principle. Um, Stormont had lots of powers. In practice, it basically couldn't actually change it. Couldn't actually change its taxes. So the danger with Calman tax, or a kind of post-referendum all of income tax, or or something in between, is basically you get a system where you have to pay the administrative costs and the compliance have the compliance costs on households in the private sector, but you can't actually use it. So I think that the, the so it's not that I'm necessarily against assigning VAT if it's very clearly part of a system that is, has got the constitutional protection for your rights to vary the tax or, and, if appropriate, alter the tax base. But pretending that saying that X percent is generated, generated in Scotland when, when, in fact, you have no policy control um, doesn't strike me as getting the kind of benefits that people seem to think that you'll get from devolved taxes. Uh, could, I, could I just come very quickly back on that? Sure. Um, I, I would emphasise that the, the, the Devo more proposals regarding VAT assignment were part of a wider package yes. um, that included the evolution of income tax and a number of other taxes, um, which is designed to help ensure that there is a wider degree of genuine tax control and accountability, but also to move beyond simply talking about accountability. Um, and ensure that there is a, a sustainable financial system, which is rooted in something I think rather more far-reaching than that. Than that, I have to say, I might be rather limited criterion. I'm just going to ask one further question because obviously time's marching on, and my colleagues have been very patient. I want to let them in, and that's just uh, again on your own uh, paper, uh, Professor Trench, and you and talking about funding Devo more. You say in, uh, in terms of implementation of fiscal devolution, paragraph 20. You say it is worth noting that these proposals amount to a programme for further devolution that would take around 15 years to implement at least. Yes. Well, um, to some, as I say, as I say in the next sentence, some steps can be delivered relatively quickly. Um, in particular, devolution of income tax, I think, is going to be much more straightforward now than it would have been five years ago, because the implementation of the Scotland Act 2012. Um, deals with a number of the key issues that are involved and perhaps even more than the legislative changes and doing things like identifying Scottish taxpayers is um, making HM Revenue and Customs address the issues of fiscal devolution in a more thoroughgoing and substantive way than it has done up till now. And that's a necessary step um, to move toward anything further than that. Um, assignment of VAT receipts, if that's done, can be done relatively quickly. Um, I mean, there are issues about working out exactly which, how much is attributable to Scotland, and that's something that on which work would need to be done. 
Um, and that would also necessarily, I suspect, be an iterative process. It would develop over time in the same way that, that all this... 15 years? Oh, these steps ordinary. would not. These, these steps are very qu These steps are relatively quick steps to take. These, these, in my view, are probably in the order of three to five years. Now, other measures are likely to take rather longer. Um, for example, one of the options that's canvassed in funding Devo more, not one that's been embraced at, at least up till now, is the idea of devolving... Um, employers' national insurance contributions, payroll taxes that are incurred for that. Now, that would only, I think, be appropriate if a devolved government were taking on a major role in relation to social security in any event. Um, but if one were to do that, that involves really quite a major reconstruction of the national insurance system, um, the roots of which go back to about 1910. Um, and it's not been through any significant change at all since 1975, and even that was comparatively limited. That's a really big administrative thing to do. So that's the sort of change that's likely to take quite a long time. Another much more minor option that I recommend is that um, corporation ga uh, capital gains tax in relation to land transactions should be devolved. Again, that's a fairly significant change that would be necessary in how CGT is um, assessed and charged and collected. Um, so you would have to do a fairly significant change to the rules for CGT. That, again, so, so that's not a straightforward um, step. Um, so, if, if one were to seek to, to, to implement the, the, those sorts of recommendations in full, I think one's into a fairly lengthy and complicated process because, as we know, Scotland Act 2012 shows us this. Um, fiscal devolution is not something that is quickly accomplished. Okay. So I, think the, I think the point I would want to stress is if you think about, if one's talking about income tax, the common tax doesn't affect savings income or dividend income. If you were going to devolve the whole of income tax, I think one of the issues you've got to worry about is actually the possibility of a tax arbitrage between income tax and corporation tax. The, there was an issue in the, in the 2000s when, when the lower corporation tax rate encouraged a lot of new incorporations. So that if you, the, 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 possibility of the possibility of arbitraging between income tax and corporation tax, and also the issue of arbitraging between income tax and income tax and capital gains tax, which is usually taxed at a lower rate. So there are complications about complications about the relationship between a Scottish tax system and the, the, the rest of the UK tax system that applies to Scotland that require careful thought. Uh, but, but I have great sympathy with the Chair's point that if you're going to do things, you clearly have to do them quite quickly. Because the critical juncture I was talking about right at the beginning, about a rising after, after, after a no vote, uh, won't last that long. So that one of the things that would be very important would be probably to get the Kalman tax implemented and actually get the Kalman tax running uh, while the legislation was put forward to actually... If, if, the, if the settlement's going to go beyond that, to actually do that. So speed would actually be quite important. So things that you could do quite quickly would actually be important to take the wind of opportunity that would then exist. Thank you very much for that. I'm now going to open up the session. The first colleague to be asking questions will be Jamie, to be followed by Malcolm. Thank you, Convener and Professor Heald. I think you indicated you did feel that there is uh, out there an appetite for cutting Scotland's funding in, in the context of a, a no vote that could become more of a, a reality. I suppose the question I have is, could the UK government achieve this without officially or formally altering the Barnett formula? Could they use another means? If, if, the, if the numerical operations of the Barnett formula were actually public at the time it's done, the answer is no, it couldn't do it without attracting attention. So my minimum, my minimum requirements is far more transparency immediately about the operation of the Barnett formula. I've been trying for 20 years to get the numbers in the public domain that actually are the comparable English spending, which actually drives changes in the Scottish spending, because they're not the same as the numbers in the identifiable expenditure in the public expenditure statistical analysis uh, white paper. The Treasury pretends not to understand the question uh, for 20 years. Now that's something that's got to be done. You've got to know exactly what spending in England is actually driving, driving Scottish, Scottish spending. So um, in, terms of Barn in terms of Barnet 
if it's not transparent, there are things that can be done without attracting attention. And there's a delightful, delightful coverage of what happened, what happened, and I think it was 1984, uh, when John Redwood, now an MP, was a was a, was, a, was an advisor, and there is the, 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 the National Archives papers actually show how they were trying to do it quietly without anybody noticing. So it's crucial, particularly if you've got the tax powers, and the finance minister's got to stand up and justify actually having a Kelman tax rate more than 10 or less than 10. You've got to have the guarantee that there's no offsetting adjustment made at the UK level. Now, so that's keeping, bar keeping Barnett. The other part of your question was, was I, 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 this is probably the biggest disagreement between the other co-witnesses and myself, is I do think that there will be big pressure post-referendum uh, to, 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 in the case of a no vote, to actually have a review of Barnett. And when people talk about review of Barnett, they usually mean cutting cotton spending. Because they've already decided, before the needs assessment takes place, that Scotland currently gets too much. I mean, look at the other evidence that got presented to this committee for, for, the, for, the, for, the, for this session. So I think that it, it is going to be a very, difficult, a very difficult context. I do not see the Scottish Government agreeing to a quick and dirty needs assessment, uh, particularly one controlled by the Treasury. Um, the alternatives you've got are the Australian-type very detailed system, which is actually very expensive, uh, controversial, but has been running for a very long time, or the kind of few, indicator, few, indicators, few indicators that generate a number. But of course, once you start generating a number that is advantageous to Wales or disadvantageous to Scotland and Northern Ireland, Scotland and Northern Ireland are going to argue. So you'll find people... What starts a simple system actually becomes more and more complicated, particularly as the jurisdictions that are getting damaged by these, by, these, by these formulas start arguing. You only have to look at the history of local government, local government uh, distribution in England to realise how political these things become. So, I mean, short answer, I suppose, the question is that because of the nature of the Barnett form, it's a fairly opaque process. I mean, we, we know the Barnett formula itself is well known, but how it's put in operation and so on. The short answer is yes, they could cut uh, it. If it wasn't made transparent, the answer is they could. But it should be, be I mean, I would just regard it as a fundamental. There's no point, you should, f the, the, the Scottish Parliament should forget completely about the Kelman tax powers or income tax powers if you don't get transparency about the grant. Well, to that, because you uh, also go on to say uh, uh, more devolved tax will mean the block grant is smaller, but its role will remain critical. The Scottish Government would have to be read for extremely tough uh, financial negotiations, and you just hinted there that the Scottish Government shouldn't agree uh, uh, a process if it isn't um, to its liking, and this is an issue we're grappling with just now, albeit on a much smaller scale, because of the two uh, smaller tax that have been devolved. But the real issue here, of course, is, and I suppose this comes back to the same issue with the paradox you talked about, the change in culture needs to be at the, the UK, the Westminster level, but the real issue surely is that power under devolution power is retained at the UK level and you can negotiate all you want but they can at the end of the day impose whatever system they so choose, can't they? Um, clearly, clearly under a devolution system a lot of power stays at the, U, stays at the UK level. Um, there, there becomes a distinct, I would make the distinction between what can be imposed secretly and what can be imposed, but it's actually in the public domain, what is being imposed. Uh, and, I, and I think that, that is actually a kind of, you know, that, that is actually a, an important difference. Uh, very, very clearly, devolution, if full, if, even kind of full fiscal devolution is not independence. You know, very clearly, powers are, certain powers are retained. But I would argue that the, there are benefits in this for the UK, because I think that the, the, the there the, are the important senses in which the UK has mismanaged its taxation system. I've already made the point about the drift of far, far more people into the higher rate, which I regard as undesirable, and w w coming closer to home, Scotland, like England, hasn't had a council tax revaluation since 1991, uh, basically destroying the credibility of the, council, of, the council, of, of, the, of the council tax as a very important form of local taxation. 
And the other thing you've seen in both Scotland and England has been, while we're all talking about the benefits for democratic accountability of having more tax powers, both the Scottish Government and the UK Government with respect to England have basically been removing uh, the council tax discretion of local authorities, either by legislative provision about referenda in England or by just playing around with the grant system. So, uh, yes, I, I think that the, the, the very clearly is an important cultural question for the UK government, but I think there's also an important cultural question in Scotland as well. You've referred, uh, Professor Heald referred to uh, your position on uh, the Barnett formula, Professor Trange, and in your paper you say no part has any commitment to change the Barnett formula after a, a no vote, and I thought that was interesting because uh, we know that the Strathclyde Commission, which I understand you advised, uh, commits to the creation of a committee of uh, all the parliaments and assemblies of the UK to look at the representation and financing of the devolved bodies in a manner which is fair to all parts of the United Kingdom. I would have thought that would have involved looking at and reviewing the Barnett formula. Uh, you also cited the Campbell Commission, paragraph 131, that states the Liberal Democrats have long believed the Barnett formula should be replaced. I know that David Cameron has previously told the Herald newspaper that the Barnett formula cannot last uh, forever. Uh, the convener uh, cited Ruth Davidson, which is, uh, she has said that she thinks there will be a review of Barnett uh, after 2014, and uh, Alistair Carmichael has previously told uh, STV that we, the Liberal Democrats, do want to see Barnet scrapped. So should we just ignore all these people and just well, take on face value that um, no party yeah. wants to scrap the Barnet formula? Um, you can you can decide whether you're going to take at face value um, those various statements which are expressing varying views and. Uh, the other person. Well, expressing one view, actually, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're, select you're, you're quoting rather selectively because you're, you're not including the many ministerial statements of current UK government position, which is no change in the Barnet formula until pu public finances are stabilised, um, which has been stated so often that one loses count. You're ignoring, for example, the statement in the Labour. Um, Scottish Labour's Devolution Commission report, which says no change to the Barnet formula, um, and the fact that, that, Campbell, that the Campbell Commission says that there would be no change in the short term. Um, I mean, the, can the Barnett formula last forever? Anything can change. Absolutely, there, there, there can be no guarantee written stone that the Barnett formula will last um, until the end of the, the planet Earth. Um, that's, that's simply impossible. Um, the Barnett formula has proved to be a remarkably durable mechanism. Um, and one suspects that, um, that at least some of its features would need to be replicated in any grant system. I mean, that's, that's, again, a reflection of the reality of the United Kingdom and of, of how the UK government works. Um, but as I say, I, see no, I just simply don't see any appetite to, to make these sorts of changes. Um, a significant part of my working life is spent dealing with Welsh issues. Um, and the pressures in Wales, the situation in Wales, are obviously entirely different to those in Scotland. Um, but life would have been made an awful lot easier in a Welsh context if there had been, if there were any sign of a willingness to make alterations in the Barnet formula. Um, and it, they're simply not forthcoming, despite a lot, of, a lot of work and a lot of political pressure being exercised. That simply never come onto the table, even from the, from the point of view of those who would, would dearly love to see it and are doing their utmost to secure it. The, the Labour position, you say, I, I select the quote, one quote I forgot to select it was Ed Balls, who has also said that of the Barnett formula, it's never intended to be long term, it needs to be looked at. Again, he's the shadow chancellor, he's Labour's prospective chancellor. Again, should we just ignore that? So, you, you, your perspective is that because they're saying one thing now, in advance of a referendum uh, on independence, they're saying they won't look at the Barnett formula, we should just trust them. Well, assuming that when they look at it, that, they, that it necessarily gets changed, assuming that that is even what happens. Um, and, 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 and come to the conclusion that it doesn't need to be changed. Well, conceivably they might. I mean, I, I, as I say, my, my own view is that 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 the Barnett formula is, for, for many administrative um, and constitutional reasons, inappropriate to the situation that we now have. I'm really quite surprised to see someone from the SNP um, speaking out in favour of the Barnett formula, which was essentially a mechanism devised to uh, to, to allocate funds to the Scottish government which is a politically distinct government with a, obviously a very distinct uh, political composition to Westminster, when the roots of the Barnett formula lie in a mechanism to allocate funding within a single government bound by collective responsibility at a time of remarkable austerity.
That's where the Barnet formula starts. Um, very different circumstances to those that we have now. Um, if, you're, if, if the SNP is really going to start urging that, that perhaps um, a devolution ought to be unpicked, well, I think that would certainly be a headline for our colleague from the press behind me. Well, I'm not particularly advocating anything. I advocate independence press. I'm trying to match the looking at, <laughs> at your. I'm looking at. I'm looking at. But I'm looking at your evidence, and your your position seems to be uh, that there will be no review of the part from. Uh, after all, that's what we're looking at today. And I, I, just, I would just counter that there seems to be. I know we can invite Professor Hill to comment in a minute as well. He seems to take a different perspective. And there seems to be a lot of evidence out there that it is uh, uh, being looked at. I see little evidence that there will be a, that, that, that there'll be any significant change. You, you, you take a. I think the, well, I have no idea what's. I have no idea what would happen, but I would fear that there would be a significant challenge, um, because I made, made the point earlier that when people talk about review of Barnet, they usually mean cutting Scotland's public expenditure. That's usually what it means. It's code code language because the people who make that argument generally have formed the conclusion based on the existing evidence that Scotland is overfunded. That's basically what drives it. Twelve years ago, you know, I suggested how you could alter the Barnett formula by altering what it converges on uh, in a way that would actually help, particularly help Wales. Um, the Labour government just closed down all debate on it. So I think that it's a bit... I, I regard it as one of the examples of fiscal mismanagement in the UK, as with council tax revaluation. We've now got ourselves an enormous problem because no government dare revalue council, ta council tax base uh, because the changes, particularly in England, would actually be really dramatic in a geographical sense. Barnet, if there'd been more transparency about Barnet and people being willing to, to discuss, discuss it, you could have easily, you could have easily made a relatively small change to Barnet which would have actually been beneficial to, beneficial to Wales. The other thing that wasn't done was think about the English regions. Because it's actually, bizarrely, Barnet is actually blamed for the economic conditions of the, of the northeast of England. And the, the reason why the northeast has been hit now, and the kind of former director of finance of Newcastle City Council, say that what's actually happening in local government terms in the northeast is actually worse than happened in the 1980s. Uh, and Barnet gets the blame, and it's nothing to do with it. So the, managing the system, we could have avoided actually having the potential crisis, potential crisis after the election. Um, in terms of whether we should trust pe what people say now, uh, I, would, I would say no. I, I do rather remember tuition fees in England uh, before the last election. In, indeed. So you, your perspective is unlike uh, Professor Trench, where people talk about reviewing the Barnet form, it's not so that they can come and say that's a perfect uh, equation, it's not going to be changed, it's because they want to cut the amount of money coming to Scotland. Uh, I would, I would... Given, given if, you read the, if you read the rest of the text in which people propose a reform of the Barnett formula, review or reform of the Barnett formula, uh, that is a fair, inter fair interpretation. I think the, the other point, the, the, the people who say there's no logic in Barnett forget the fact this is an attempt to make asymmetric devolution work uh, for 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 fourteen percent for sixteen percent of the UK population, um, the centralisation of the UK is much more intense than the centralisation in other states of a, other states of a, of a similar size. So you can criticise you can criticise Barnet uh, you know, from first principles, but what you've got to look at is what functional role Barnet plays. And what I've argued is what functional role it's played is give this parliament and this government its autonomy about how to spend, how to spend a fixed budget and actually given stability about what that funding, what that budget is. And my view is if you give the... If you, the fact that the Scottish Parliament and government has got reasonable predictability about the future budget, that is actually a beneficial consequence. So when people say there's no logic behind Barnet, I think that's wrong. I think that there, there is a case where Barnet ought to, Barnet ought to be managed or the name changed or something, but, but, but it doesn't mean to say... The, 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 idea that, the idea that a needs assessment will be simple and the idea that uh, once you find out, once you find out, as people expect, that Scotland and Northern Ireland are overfunded, the adjustment process will be easy, I think is, is just wrong. 
final question, if I may, uh, convener, uh, it's uh, again from your uh, paper, Professor Trench, you say all three pro-UK parties are now committed to further forms of devolution in the event of a no vote, but would you accept that essentially those proposals have come from the, the Scottish branches of those parties and the, uh, whether or not there'll be uh, further devolution is reliant on the UK political level, and I know you have yourself been somewhat critical of uh, their handling of uh, the devolution of further powers. You mentioned your Devo Matters blog. I know that you were uh, fairly critical of uh, the UK government in terms of its failure to uh, ca take forth the Calvin Commission recommendation on uh, the devolution of APD. Uh, and again, the Strathclyde Commission, which you advised, made the call for uh, that the devolution of that. It so happens we had uh, David Gawk, a, a UK Treasury Minister, before us. Recently, this was an area we were able to explore with him, and it was pretty clear there was no commitment from uh, him, uh, from his government, uh, and given that it's his party's commission that made the recommendation, I thought there might have been, uh, there's no commitment to see the devolution of APD, and he merely, he called the, the commission merely a welcome uh, a contribution to the debate. It's hardly a, a round endorsement of his own party's uh, position on the commission. Uh, I, suppose, I know you can't answer for uh, him, but I suppose the point I'm making is, if they're not likely to devolve APD, it doesn't seem realistic, is it, that they're going to substantially devolve anything else? Well, I, um, I wouldn't agree. I mean, APD, I'm just looking it up, is a comparatively small tax. Um, it's about, half, according to the, the legislation of JERS in 2012-13, it, it was half a percent of total North Sea tax revenues. So it's a very minor tax. It's not in any sense a significant source of revenue. Um, it is arguably useful as a policy lever, um, and it, the evolution of it that was sought by Kalman and recommended by Strathclyde Commission on that basis. Um, given the overall concerns that of, of trying to secure a wider package for secure devolved funding, I wouldn't worry a great deal about 0.5% when there are much larger sources of revenue that are under discussion. So that's the point, isn't it? If they're not willing to devolve something so... Minimal. Yes. What, what, how, why would we take it in faith that they're going to evolve anything substantial? Because it's both legally intricate. There's, there are, I gather, some state aids issues involved. Um, there are also some there are also some quite complicated issues about airline regulation and air, aircraft regulation. You might have noticed that this is particularly a concern for southern England and particularly a concern about where runaways get located in southern England. So, um, as is not as is quite often the case with these sorts of issues, you get tangled up in what in, in a wider debate. Um, it's not, I don't, it isn't, it can't be the main thrust of these discussions. There is, as I said, um, in response to the, the convener um, at the beginning of this session, um, a, a, a key reliance on the sorts of political will to drive these things. And I see signs that suggest that there's a political will present that um, I have regretted not seeing in the past. And I see that I see that from UK party lever, party levels, as well as from uh, the Scottish parties. Well, let's not make APD the thrust of uh, the question. Then I suppose the the question is: you would accept this is reliant <coughs> on uh, the UK political level. That's the nature of, of devolution. I mean, you uh, seem to indicate that there's there's will, but there's. There's no guarantee here, is there? There's no guarantee we're going to see this devolution. Um, well, there are the political guarantees from each of the individual parties and from the statements that the, the three Scottish leaders made collectively a week or so ago while I was, was overseas. Um, and, um, I mean, you, you'll, you'll, the Lib Dem position, of course, was drawn up by Ming Campbell, um, a, former, a former leader of the party at UK level. Um, I gather there were extensive consultations between UK and Scottish parties in relation to the framing of the Scottish Labour Devolution Commission. Um, and um, I, I believe there's, well, there's very clearly very significant support from uh, the Conservative Party for the Strathclyde Commission, as was shown by the Prime Minister uh, when the report was published. The UK Minister before us answering questions where he referred to the Strathclyde Commission as a welcome contribution to the debate. You don't view that as, I think, certainly I viewed it and others might, as just kicking it into the long grass. Well, the last time I looked, the Prime Minister bats rather ahead of the, of the Executive Secretary to the Treasury in the political order. Prime Minister better have a word with uh, Mr Gock then, hadn't he? Because he was here giving us evidence and he wasn't sticking to the message then, was he? Well, you better, go. better recall from, uh, Mr Gork and ask him that.
Um, okay, it's uh, Malcolm to fall by Jean. I think one of the main issues that's emerged from, from both of you this morning is the importance of transparency in relation to the Barnet formula. And I noticed that um, Alan Trench referred to this um, in connection with um, funding Devo more, and he said the issue of suggestions about greater transparency and greater scope for impartial intervention and review of decisions about the formula were all dealt with there. Now, I know you'll be shocked to hear this, but I haven't actually read Chapter 7 of Funding Devo more, and I wouldn't ask you to give a full account of it, but it would, I think, be helpful to us if you could kind of, in a few sentences, given that it's emerged as perhaps the main theme of this morning, uh, if you could uh, sort of um, at least assure us that there are... Um, concrete ways of dealing with that problem, and no doubt Professor Hilda would want to uh, suggest ways of doing it as well. Um, chapter 7 of Funding Devo More, which I would be happy to read for the benefit of the official record, <laughs> if uh, members would so wish, um, is headed Institutional Implications of Reform. And it looks in particular at two uh, specific issues. Um, one are arrangements for tax collection, and the other is, arrange, is wider arrangements in particular for the remaining grant element. Um, and um, Funding Devo Moore talks about a very different approach to grant to the Barnett formula. Um, and I would draw um, your, your colleague, you and your colleague's attention to what it says in, I think it's chapter six, uh, chapters five and six um, on that front. Um, as far as the institutions are concerned, um, I think there are some very strong arguments to continue to use um, HMRC as a tax collection agency, particularly, well, for VAT, I think it's inevitable, given EU rules, and also for income tax, because otherwise you significantly increase complication for taxpayers. Um, you're likely to lose at least many of the benefits of the PAYE system, which are huge. Um, it makes life very simple for taxpayers, but it also makes tax collection both cheap and effective for, 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 for government. So a, our system is rather good for all the problems that exist within HMRC, on which I suspect you're better informed than I am. Um, that said, I think that means some changes in the governance arrangements for HMRC, um, which would include things like, quite possibly, um, appointing a member of the board of HMRC um, um, so that it becomes accountable to all the governments on whose behalf it collects taxes rather than simply being an agency of the UK government that happens to hand over a chunk of the revenue that it collects to one of them. And I think that there also then needs to be some sort of independent body established more generally to review the system and in particular to carry out calculations in relation to grant and manage that transparency. Um, and I think that the model, the best model that I've seen comparatively for that is that of the Commonwealth Grants Commission. Now, as he had mentioned earlier, um, the, the Australian approach and on the level of how the grant is calculated, I entirely agree with him. It's a system that's wide open to gaming, that's, that's quite expensive to run, is, an, is really very unwieldy. Um, but the role of the Commonwealth Grants Commission as an institution is impressive. It's an independent commission appointed partly by, uh, on, on nomination of the states, partly on nomination of the federal government. The members are impartial, uh, are independent once they're appointed, as is the chairman, and it provides advice to the, very public advice, and very formal advice to the federal treasurer, the federal equivalent of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, who has never been known not to act on that advice. So although it is technically an advisory body, it is extremely authoritative advice, and any departure from it would be very conspicuous, very public, very conspicuous, and be likely to trigger major sources of political dispute. So I think that that ends up being about the best approach that there is to be, be found around, from around the world, and it's one that I think would work well in a UK context. Anything more about transparent, how we actually achieve more transparency, Professor Hilder, is that? Um, well, basically, the Chancellor of the Exchequer has got to tell the Treasury to do it. I mean, the, the kind of... We come, back to, we come back to a point that came up earlier. Um, Scotland's 10% of the population of England, yet, as with the Six Nations, we actually think of ourselves as equal to England. And so, in a sense, Westminster, Westminster and Whitehall are to some extent inevitably dominated by a, 
a, a, a, a London a London and UK agenda. I think the, the crucial point. I, I would agree with that you need. I would agree with my co-witness that you need something like the something like a territorial exchequer board uh, to actually manage the mechanics. But I think crucially to make the tax devolution work, the UK has got to bring its budget forward. So the UK has got to bring its budget forward. There's absolutely no reason why the UK has to set its tax rates at, at the end of end of March. So if the UK budget came forward around the November, December time, at the time of the, uh, of the autumn statement, which basically is another budget every year, uh, it would be able to coordinate, it would be much simpler to coordinate the tax policy at the UK level and at the, and at the Scottish level. And the more interfaces you have between taxes run by this parliament and taxes run by the Westminster parliament, that becomes very important. So transparency is not difficult. The, 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 there's two things about transparency. One, of, one is the information has got to be put in the public domain at the time. And secondly, there has to be sufficient background explanation so that it's actually accessible to people. So saying it's published in some obscure place on the Treasury website or you know, on page 321 of a budget document doesn't actually help, necessarily help. So it's got to be up front and in time. So it's a, political, it's a political will question. Well, I think um, the other main theme of this morning is also a political will question, obviously, just you know, to what extent Barnett would be uh, changed um, uh, soon if, if there was a no vote. And I, I agree with Alan Trench on this. And, and like him, I think the views of leader, leaders of political parties are, are what we should be looking at <coughs> ra rather than... Uh, some others that have been emphasised. but And I suppose the other thing that it seems to me that feeds into this is because we are, and again, I absolutely believe on a no vote there would be more fiscal uh, devolution, that that, in fact, in itself, in the short run, I think, uh, and possibly the longer run, uh, actually helps to entrench the Barnett formula because, firstly, you have, uh, obviously, a smaller uh, block grant in the context of fiscal devolution. But secondly, when you're in a period of transition like that, you, you need to have stability in the, in the grant mechanism in order to uh, make the, uh, the fiscal changes work, which is why I think you have the, the kind of no, no detriment um, commitment. So, I mean, would, would, would you agree that, in fact, that it, in the context of more fiscal devolution, that in, in a kind of way, that, that is a reason why there will not be some dramatic change uh, to, the, to the grant mechanism during that process of change? Um, I think that's, well... I think that that's, that will certainly be an, an argument that would have a lot of attraction to both UK ministers and UK officials, um, whatever its merits might be here. Um, and as I say, one, one of the great virtues of the Barnett Formula system is that it produces stability and predictability in public spending for all the problems of transparency uh, that there are. It's nonetheless better at that than many other systems. Moving to, a system, moving to greater reliance on own tax revenues is necessarily introducing an element of volatility. And um, I suspect one wants to be able to manage the risks of that. I suppose the, the other thing that we talk a lot about in the context of further fiscal devolution, and particularly in terms of the income tax powers we're getting, is, is, the, is the block grant adjustment. And obviously there's, uh, I think, an agreed kind of uh, formula for that. I mean, how, how does that interrelate with these discussions about transparency of the Barnet and so on? Because that there would seem to be some relationship between the two? Well, indeed. I mean, Professor Heald has been touching on this uh, regularly during this discussion. That mechanism certainly, and I, I entirely agree with him, needs to be very, very clear. Um, and it needs to be as transparent and mechanical and automatic as possible once it's agreed and put in place. Uh, because otherwise you run into the difficulties and the dangers of having a soft rather than a hard budget constraint. Um, and that's disadvantageous, I think, on both sides. Um, it certainly is likely to lead to difficulties in the medium to longer term. Um, and this is actually one of the reasons why in the medium to longer term there are arguments to look at, to, 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 re to review the Barnett mechanisms. Um, whatever one does with the quantum of funding, those mechanisms are likely to get quite creaky if you get to the point of significant tax devolution. Um, because you're going to be using an increasingly notional idea of um, the Barnett formula uh, the Barnet form, the block grant as it would be under the Barnet formula, which, as Professor Heald has been explaining, um, is something that's quite hard to measure. Uh, about which there's a lot of doubt um, when one gets into actually ascertaining what's going on. On the one hand, 
and on the other, you're then going to be talking about um, uh, what will necessarily be notional estimates of what would be tax revenue if tax decisions in Scotland had not been made. Um, and so when you've got that level of notional calculation going around, um, there can be some quite significant issues, I think, coming back to accountability and transparency. And that, uh, the, the, the mechanism that's outlined in, in funding Devo more is an attempt to get, to get round those. Um, and key to that, actually, is some periodic mechanisms for review to avoid exactly the situation that, we've been, that the Professor Hill's been discussing regarding um, council tax and the absence of revaluation. These things go badly wrong when they are simply not, not kept in good order. They need to be periodically maintained and reviewed in order to work. So just two final points to Professor Hild. Um, one looking forward and one looking back. Um, you refer to NHS expenditure in England projected to fall by 9.1%. Uh, well, that's real terms age adjusted, which is an interesting concept. Um, but, I mean, surely the fact of the matter is that because of the um, health expenditure rising uh, in accordance with inflation, that, that actually works to the benefit of the, this parliament in terms of um, the, the, amount, the significant amount of uh, consequentials that flow from English health expenditure. Yeah. There's two parts of that. Uh, the, the, one of the advantages of the system for Scotland has been that the, the, the big cuts in local government in England and cuts in education as a whole and in law and order and justice have been significantly offset by increases in English health. So the, 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 the Cabinet Secretary for Finance had the option of not penalising local authorities anything like as harshly as has been done in England. So, so it's been a very good example of, of the, the fact that things came into a pool of money, which, the, which was a Scottish decision about how to spend it, has, actu has, has actually been a, 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 a significant protection. I, mean, I, I just, I think it comes from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, but it, it, the concept of age-related health, it, it seems oh, yeah. to be a bit, it seems a bit misleading, really, because it's still increasing in line with inflation, which we all know is not enough, but it still actually helps the budget of this parliament. Sorry, I forgot that point when, yeah. mm -hmm. when I was answering. Um, I think that is a pretty big signal from the, the Institute for Fiscal Studies that they don't think the UK plans are sustainable. Uh, the, 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 that's taking it through to 2018-19, which is beyond the kind of any detailed plans being available, uh, because spending review uh, 2013 only covered 15-16. I think they're trying to send a signal about that actually that is actually not sustainable. And I mean, the, the kind of very clearly, uh, that they're, they're making the point that even with the ring fence, in real terms on English health expenditure, the actual effect of uh, what in the jargons call the relative price effect that, that costs go up faster and in, in, in health than in the, GD, the, the economy as a whole, and also the population composition has changed. I think the IFS are trying to signal just quite how tough the, the kind of plans are, even, even, with, even with protection. So I think there's, there, there, is, there is a signaling thing going on that after the next election, the projected forward plans are going to be extremely, extremely painful. Well, I agree with that, but it's, it's mainly a point about health and the nature of health expenditure, which would be the same whether we were part of the UK or independent. I mean, yes. there wouldn't be any difference yes. in that room. My final point is looking backwards, which was the interesting point you made about temporary Barnet consequentials. But... I don't know. I mean, I seem to remember arguments about the baseline stretching back, but the, surely the point there is that there would be also that would also simply reflect a, a corresponding fall in the English baseline. So it's not really it's not really a change to the Barnett formula in that sense, because there would only be a change to the Barnett formula if it was a, a relative advantage to England rather than Scotland. I mean, there is in terms of the Olympic example, but in terms of changing the baseline, I mean, people are always arguing about changing the baseline, but it doesn't. It's not really. A change in the Barnett formula, is it? Um, I, I understand your point relative to England, but 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 the, 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 it is a it is a way of the Treasury imposing cuts 
on future budgets without actually being quite open about what is actually happening. But I agree it doesn't affect the Scotland England relative. If, it goes, if, if the reversal goes back through the formula uh, in the way that it came, the, the original, temp, uh, original amounts came through the formula, I agree with you. Uh, followed by Michael. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, Professor Trench, I know you, you equate a no vote um, with a rejection of full fiscal autonomy. Is it fair to say that you believe that Devo Max could never be achieved under the Union? Uh, yes. I, th I think that, that, that to the extent that full fiscal autonomy is necessarily part of, of that maximal form of relationship, that would involve the UK government being responsible for Scottish, um, for, for defence, foreign affairs, um, international aid, and conceivably immigration, but nothing else in relation to Scotland. That that Diva, that that, full, that that's incompatible with um, with the union, and that that's if in that 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 a no vote in the referendum is also a rejection of that option. So would you say that the plans for put forward by the, by the no camp or the, the no parties really is devolution for devolution's sake. I mean, it, it's, um, it would transfer some powers, not necessarily because of financial, uh, getting it right financially, but, but politically. Um, well, um, I can't comment on what will actually happen in the future um, after a, a no vote and after a process that, that, that will follow a no vote. Um, but certainly what Funding Devo Moore was, was, was trying to do was to find a workable, has been doing, um, is to find a workable model for further devolution. I don't know quite what devolution for devolution's sake means. What's very clear to me, looking at the evidence, most particularly from Scottish Social Surveys, uh, Scottish Social, Social Attitude Surveys, over a decade or more, is that... What's the, the, the Scottish voters like devolution and they want more of it. They want, self, they want extensive self-government within the union, not outside it. That, that doesn't appear to me to include it Devo, necessarily to include Devo Max, though conceivably it might, um, but that I don't think is acceptable on the other side of the equation. So the question is finding out how one can establish a workable scheme that, broadly speaking, corresponds with those preferences of Scottish voters that is also compatible with their other preference to remain within rather than outside the UK. I think the other point I would make is that one's got to remember Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, Scotland and England are remarkably alike on average uh, in, for example, GDP and fiscal capacity but Wales and Northern Ireland are actually much poorer. So you can actually run fiscal devolution as far as Scotland's concerned without worrying too much about e equalisation of tax bases. Uh, but the, the, the potential yield per head of income tax, for example, in Wales is very significantly below, uh, below the kind of uh, Scotland and England levels. So that one of the things which will come out in debates after the referendum would be would be the question about what you how does what one gives Scotland affect what is in future possible for Wales and Northern Ireland, and there's an important sense in which um, Wales and Northern Ireland have been carried along by Scotland over the, over the last twenty years, uh, but very clearly. Not only are Wales and Northern Ireland much poorer than Scotland, Wales in particular is much more economically integrated with England than Scotland is. In terms of running a tax system, uh, the Holtham Commission has got a wonderful diagram showing what proportion of the population live within 50 miles, 25 miles or 50 miles from the, from the border. Uh, so that basically the English-Scottish border is not highly populated. So running t a separate tax system in Wales is much more difficult. But still, I think that, that in terms of what, the, what Scotland should be thinking about is what is good for Scotland, but also what the implications are in terms of uh, a possible extension of certain parts of that scheme to Wales and Northern Ireland. If I, if I might just add, that's an explicit part of the design of the funding of the Devo Moore project. Um, it's been deliberately designed to try and work out what's workable across the UK as a whole, um, not simply in relation to Scotland, but with the expectation Scotland would be first in line, but not necessarily the only, only part of the UK in line. 
given that um, Professor Heald, you said earlier that there was, you had been, I can't now remember the context, but there was, uh, a, you were pushing for recognition or some uh, uh, changes for the last 20 years um, and clarity over taxations and so on. Would you say then that devolution in Scotland and then the advent of uh, the SNP majority government has actually forced all of these issues to be seriously considered and that in a, a country with a very complicated tax system, which is desperately, I believe, in need uh, of change, that this is a, a, a fantastic opportunity for that? The problem, the problem in the UK is that people tend to want Scandinavian levels of public services for American levels of taxation. Uh, the, the, that's a fundamental problem. And one of the issues about fiscal devolution is that I notice that there is a kind of uh, something of a misalignment between people wanting to spend more and actually wanting to reduce taxes. Uh, that aside, I think your basic point is right. I think the fact of the SNP majority, the SNP majority government bringing around a referendum has actually brought this back on the political on the political on the political agenda. Uh, but very clearly, this argument has, this argument has been going back to the seventies about what the right way of what the right way of um, of funding the Scottish Parliament would be, a devolved Scottish Parliament would be. As I've said, right back to the nineteen seventies, I've been I have been an enthusiast for tax powers when when there was virtually nobody else keen on tax powers for a, for, a devolved, for, for a devolved parliament. But the point I'm making now is, although I still remain support for tax powers, you have to think about how the system as a whole, as a whole works. So your point about this being a window of opportunity, I agree with. I think that, that, yeah, that this may well be another, this may well be another push. In the same way, uh, the, the 18 years of Conservative government in the 1980s and 1990s actually was the push to why the Scottish Parliament happened in the first place. Just finally, uh, you mentioned at one point, with reference to the Barnett formula, um, a kind of irritation, politically, I gather, I, I, I presume, uh, with the fact that the Scottish government has not imposed tuition fees. I mean, is that not the whole point of, of devolving uh, funding, that one country makes uh, different priorities? Um, I couldn't agree more with with you. Um, however, what the way it's seen in Scotland is that policy variation always involves more expenditure in Scotland, and people have then f made one further step and argue the reason that Scotland can afford it is that Scotland's underfunded, o overfunded in the first place. That that's the log that's the logic, be that's the logic behind the the, the, the position I was describing. Do you ever correct them? I think that there's been a successive Scottish governments have been nervous about a needs assessment. The Treasury, since the 1978 one published in 79, there have been some informal exercises uh, and some rather more systematic exercises within the Treasury uh, on needs assessment, but they've never got into the public, never got into the public, into the public domain. But I think that kind of um, successive Scottish governments have been nervous about. Um, having the issue opened, uh, not least the fact it is going to be, a, if there is a needs assessment, it will become an incredibly time-consuming exercise, contrary to what, for example, Gerald Holton thinks. I think that, that, that once it gets started, it will get legs of its own, um, and, and it will be a quite a, a long and painful process. That will be avoided with a yes vote. <laughs> You would I'm, not, I'm not here to express constitutional preferences. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks very much, gentlemen, for your um, evidence so far. It's, it's good to hear from experts this morning. Um, and you're, you, you mentioned earlier about the, 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 the desire to have um, high levels of public expenditure at, at low levels of taxation, uh, Professor Heald, and in your... Um, paper, you say that the in, in relation to the implications of extra tax powers. At point 12, you make four what you say are highly relevant observations, the fourth of which at point D, that claims that lower tax rates could be self-financing through higher economic growth should always be treated with suspicion. But that's exactly what's on offer uh, to us uh, at the present time. We're told that 
um, regardless of any fiscal deficit that Scotland might have. Uh, we won't need to increase taxation. We can continue to spend more because there is a magic bullet of lower corporation tax, which will solve our growth problems and, and solve all of our financial problems. Should we treat that with suspicion? Yes. I think that one should always treat... I mean, when, when um, going back to Ronald Reagan in the, in the US, when people start arguing that you're going to get enormous supply-side effects from reduced taxation, uh, you should be suspicious. Um, one of the things that what you may do is you may, as with Ireland and Luxembourg, you may attract corporate, co co corporate tax do domicile. So what you may get, what you may get, is significant increases in your corporation tax revenues without without much real benefit, real benefit to the economy. Um, I getting get very annoyed at people on posters, for example, having comparing GDP. Now GDP is a useful concept. But you've got to understand it, understand what's involved. And there's a very good, countries like Ireland and Ireland and Luxembourg have enormous differences between gross domestic product per capita, where they're enormously high, and gross national income per capita, where the, 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 where their levels are much more much more suppressed because because there are claims of foreign residents on the on the production. I mean, in the case of Scotland, the North Sea is a very significant example of where, where, where the incomes generated in North Sea, a lot of them don't actually come to Scotland because the people who work there don't, aren't necessarily Scottish residents and the companies are, the companies are foreign-owned. Foreign so you, a well-designed tax system, and the, Murley's report has already been mentioned, a well-designed tax system may have beneficial effects on the economy, uh, but... but Playing around at the edges with either with corporation tax, which everywhere is going down rapidly anyway, so the kind of, you can't reproduce the Irish Merkel with corporation tax because the trend internationally of corporation tax is, 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 to, is, to, fall quite, is to fall quite dramatically. And with their passenger duty, you may, you may, you, you may get some recirculation of, of, uh, of journeys from, you know, from uh, English airports to Welsh airports or Scottish airports. English airports to, to, to Welsh airports. But the extent to which this is a real economic benefit or basically just a transfer is something you should be careful about. Um, um, I don't think I have a, I have a lot to add. Um, I think that the hazard with corporation tax is exactly as Professor Heald says, um, that you get um, what's known as brass plating to little economic utility. Um, and that applies whether you are devolving it or whether you're exercising it within, a soft, within an independent state. We've heard in evidence uh, to this committee before that even if we have this argument around uh, lower corporation tax, that the margins that, that have to be extended uh, in order to, to get the benefits, if there are any benefits, have to be quite extensive. You know, the Scottish Government are proposing a 3% difference between the, the the corporation tax rate, whatever it is, uh, across the rest of the UK, that they would maintain a level 3% lower than that. But the evidence that we've been given is that the difference between, say, Germany and uh, Ireland is something like 18%, and still the difference is not, uh, is not significant in terms of attracting inward investment. So is that the type of levels of difference that are required before we can see uh, any financial benefit from corporation tax in relation to competition? Well, um, I think I, I mean, that's, that's certainly part of it. I mean, um, Professor Heald's mentioned the Irish miracle, and it's fairly clear that the Irish miracle was dependent on a number of factors. Um, one of them was a skilled English-speaking workforce um, and a young workforce. Another was that the miracle more or less coincided with the, concept, with the completion of the European single market. So Ireland was able to mark itself using that combination of incentives as a very attractive place for um, particularly North American corporations to do business and gain access to this dramatically expanding European market in a relatively friendly way because they had access to English an English-speaking workforce. Um, Number one, that trick has already been pulled and it's likely to be a one-round um, um, exercise. So Scotland isn't going to, would not be able to replicate that. Number two, um, we, we all know how that story has ended. 
Um, and the, part of the problem was that the economic boom that it triggered turned into a real estate boom that went, spectac that, that, that went spectacularly badly wrong and both affected both not only private finances but also debt fi um, pu uh, public debt as well from bank bailouts. So, um, I mean, Ireland, Ireland gives you, I think, more lessons for caution than lessons for, um, for, for, for optimism. And um, as Professor Hill says, corporation tax is a declining tax over the long term. Um, this is one of the reasons why, why I think assignment to VAT is of the options available a very attractive one. Um, it's a growing tax. Go for a gro growth tax rather than a, than, than a shrinking one. Um, that's why um, in Australia the GST was deliberately sought by the states to be the underpinning for the redistribution system for their funding because they wanted access to a, a tax that was growing over time. Uh, what happened shortly after the, the present form of the system was introduced was that because tax receipts went had been increasing so dramatically through the GST, the federal treasurer tried to get his hands on them um, and had to be fought off. Um, because he decided that it, the deal that they'd offered was not such a good deal after all, but he was fought off, and the states continue to benefit from the, the increase of that pool of, of revenue. It's an interesting uh, argument. We, we've discussed this uh, previously and had evidence that you know, VAT uh, would be a, a better use of um, you know, tax-raising powers to, to benefit Scotland. Uh, but we, we have to do that in the context of the UK being the, the member state of the European Union. And the example you've given us there is of Australia. So the problem that I would foresee is, would the European Union permit such an arrangement? Are there examples of that in other European Union states? The Australian system as such would be perfectly capable of being applied elsewhere if the conditions were right. I don't think that the Australian model is right in a UK context because the UK has, de has decentralised much, much more spending responsibility than the Australian system and it's a significantly more unequal country than Australia is. Australia is a remarkably homogeneous country with a couple of pockets of quite serious um, poor, poor tax performance and high spending need. Um, one of them is Tasmania, which is reasonably but not very populous, and the other is the Northern Territory, which is very empty indeed. Um, and otherwise, Australia is really very homogeneous. It, sh it shows some patterns of change over time, which is also a contrast to the UK, in which, in which states are, re, are, are, are the more prosperous or the less prosperous. Um, but if you wanted to import that model, because the GST is a consistent tax across the whole of Australia, um, subject to certain, certain fairly limited adaptations, I don't see why you couldn't, as a matter of principle, impose that in the UK. That's helpful. Thanks, Gavin. Thank you. Uh, Gavin, to be followed by John. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Professor, Professor Trench, uh, paragraph 20, you talk about the time scale yes. of implementation. I know the, I think it was the convener who asked a little bit on that first. Um, she clarified that the, the 15 years would refer to um, capital gains tax and national insurance. You felt the other uh, measures could be implemented uh, relatively quickly. Um, just for the record, I mean, what, what do you define as relatively quickly for... Uh, so income tax, first of all. As I said earlier, three to five years. Um, I mean, as I say, I think this, this, this certainly is, as far as Devo Moore is, is, is concerned, this is a programme, um, not a simple one-shot arrangement. Um, I mean, one other, one other aspect is perhaps worth mentioning as well as CG, I mentioned CGT and National Insurance, is alcohol and tobacco duties. And I think particularly for alcohol, there's a very strong case for devolution of tax there to get around some of the problems, particularly that minimum pricing introduces. Um, and because of the, the problems, the social problems that, there, that arise with alcohol consumption in Scotland. But there are real difficulties with doing that. Um, they arise from EU law and it also has to be said from the Treaty of Union. Um, because the Treaty of Union said there has to be a single level of excise duty within the new uni uh, United Kingdom. Um, now, I sus um, and the EU rules are fairly significant. There are two ways you can address that issue. One is a sequence of bodges and workarounds um, to try and mean that there is a that there's a t that there is a tax charge that inflates the price, um, that therefore brings revenue to the public purse in, as, as part of the mechanism for using price to discourage consumption. Um, and that's a convoluted way of achieving a goal that I would rather achieve directly if one could. 
Uh, the direct way of doing it would be by some sort of supplemental sales tax, but that conflicts with the EU rule for single VAT. Now, I suspect that that's one of those rules that if in the right circumstances, if the game were played in the right way, might be capable of being changed. It would be a significant change at EU level, um, and one would need to play the EU game very astutely um, and recruit the appropriate allies. But there are a number of European member states, EU member states, that do have interests in fiscal devolution. Um, and I wouldn't regard that as being a lost cause at the outset, however difficult the path to ending it might be. In terms of the timescale for the assignment of VAT, is that a similar timescale to, to the income tax one? So yes. three, probably three to... I mean, if anything, it could be done much more quickly. Um, the, the, I think the real obstacle there is because it's, it, as the tax will continue to be collected by a single agency. Um, the question really is working out the appropriate um, apportionments in relation to Scotland and the mechanism for apportionment. And we have, of course, figures in JERS that are based on an understanding of how much VAT revenue is attributable to Scotland. But those numbers would need to become much more robust. And the mechanism for calculating them, capable of a, a, a agreement and agreed between the, the, the two the, the governments involved. Um, thank you. Now, in terms of, I mean, one of, I think, your reasons for suggesting VAT is that you describe it as um, not a volatile tax. Um, now, obviously, one can study the figures, but how, how volatile is VAT when compared to, say, income tax? I mean, it, it, can, can you well, give us just a, a rough estimate of how, how um, we compare? There are some figures for this that you will find on Table 4.3 of Funding Devo More um, that, that try to show this in relation to VAT, income tax and corporation tax at UK level and for Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. Um, the short answer is that... Um, it is, it, it, it's more or less, well, it dep I'm, I'm hesitant to say definitively because the numbers for which I used at that point were the best numbers we had. They're now a couple of years out of date. The methodologies have changed. And um, I, I, it, it depends very much on one's talking about a recession as deep as the one we've been through, when exactly you start and when you stop, because that really can introduce quite a significant skew. Um, in aggregate, broadly, it's roughly about as volatile as income tax. One of the things I was intrigued by and thought was a very useful fact while working on funding Devo more was that they run on different cycles, that, um, that VAT receipts took longer to fall than income tax but came back somewhat later. And that means that actually the two taken together help balance out each other's volatilities. So as part of a package of funding, that strikes me as a way of actually using one tax to help manage a risk from another, um, in a way I think is quite attractive, or ought to be attractive from the point of view of a finance minister. You, you talked about VAT, you believe is going to be a tax that is growing in terms of the, the revenues collected. Is, I suppose it's hard to say... Uh, predict too far into the future, but is that a, do you think it's a kind of one that's going to grow in the short to medium term and the long term, or is it one that you just you know you can't predict what happens? But do you, do you think it's broadly one that that you see growth in perpetuity? Um, I don't know about in perpetuity, but I think it's fair to say that in the medium to long term, um, that 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 taxes like corporation tax um, are under really serious pressure on a worldwide scale and that the burden of taxation is shifting toward um, indirect taxes like VAT. Um, Professor, you'll just be briefly on that point. I mean, you, you talked about, you said we ought to be cautious, I think, about assignment. Um, just to be clear, are, are you saying you, you would be against the idea of assigning VAT, or are you saying be cautious about it and make sure it's um, done uh, as part of a package, because you don't have the same, I think you said you don't have the same accountability factor. <clears throat> yeah, my point, was, my, my point was that there comes a public confusion about whether you actually, whether rev revenues you raise that you have control over, revenues that you don't have any control over. The assigned VAT, one would have no control, no control over the amount of revenues you get. And if you get a recession like 2008, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to have to have quite deep borrowing powers because obviously you, what one doesn't want to do is adjust your spending 
sharply downwards during during a during a big recession like that. So very clearly, if you have assignment, you have to have some kind of borrowing mechanism, which might be a genuine uh, an external borrowing mechanism, or it might be a, a, within the within the funding system of the relationship to, between the with the with the UK government. Um, the point I keep making is that I worry about people's enthusiasm to have more tax powers, but then ended up with a system where the tax powers are, are, are unusable. They ossify, the administrative infrastructure collapses, and when the finance minister wants to use them, upwards or downwards, you find you can't actually use them. That may have happened uh, a couple of years ago um, in Scotland. Um, I'm grateful for that. I was particularly interested, Professor Heald, in, in you talking about the Scottish rate of income tax and this um, you know, the current suggestion that a deadline of late autumn would be set uh, on the Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament outlining what, what that rate would be. Um, we've obviously touched on this as a committee, and I think we're going to be doing future work on it over the next uh, year or so. Um, in, in terms of trying to get round that issue, um, clearly you could bring the UK budget forward to November, December, as, as you alluded to. Um, you could... Um, delay the Scottish budget or change the deadline to say that you don't have to tell us in uh, autumn, you can tell us in you know, the weeks leading up to the budget. I mean, there, I suppose there are different ways around it. Have you, how much thought have you given to how we might solve this problem? And I just wonder if you have anything else to say on it, because I think it's, it's pretty important. I think the, the, point, the, 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 point I, the point I was making is that once the Scottish Parliament decides to use the tax power, differently from the Kalman 10. You immediately get the question is, what is the UK government going to do in March that's going to affect either the yield or the political acceptability of it? One of the things the Office for Budget Responsibility says is, is the income distribution in Scotland is actually quite different from the income distribution of England, uh, of England, particularly if you take to London and the South East, in the sense that Scotland's got fewer very high taxpayers and more people who are low taxpayers. So the actual distribution of where the revenue comes from is different. So any decision taken about thresholds and about whether thresholds are indexed, for example, is going to have significant effects. Uh, also, I made the point that, that in the public mind, there isn't as much distinction between national insurance, which as an economist I would regard as a tax anyway, uh, and income tax. So kind of what the UK government is going to do, um, Gordon Brown, when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, was quite keen to say, I'm not going to put income tax rates up, but he did actually put up national insurance contributions. So the kind of the Scottish government's budget calculations and the political credibility and acceptability calculations can be messed up. My view is it would be hugely beneficial to the UK to pull the UK budget forward. And that would enable a sensible debate to take place uh, in Scotland and in the UK about budget changes. Because, because chancellors survive in the UK Parliament on pulling things out of a hat uh, without any kind of parliamentary considerations. And you know, significant mistakes in UK UK budget policy, the ten pence rate introduction and the ten pence rate cancellation were both, in my view, misguided policies. Misguided policies, uh, but there is a pressure on the Chancellor to do something. Um, the Lamborghini um, exemption for the the, the, the so-called Lamborghini case of people get, not having to put their pensions in pensions into in, in, in annuities. Another one. There's great pressure for the Chancellor uh, in Westminster to actually have something exciting to put in the budget. Now, I would regard a good budget as one that, which was not exciting. But that is not the political... That is not The tax system has to be managed in the medium to long term. So what you run the danger of is getting remarkable amounts of silly churn. Uh, and I think that you bringing the UK budget forward getting some kind of proper parliamentary process at Westminster, and I proposed a tax and spend committee uh, to the UK Parliament quite recently, um, you know, where, there is that, where the Chancellor actually comes with a draft budget, with a draft budget, there are some things you, on the tax side you very clearly cannot announce um, in advance because there would be, people would evade or avoid. Uh, but quite a lot of things you can. Uh, so there would be a much more serious debate 
in Westminster in terms of what was going to happen to thresholds rates. As I say, the, the remarkable you know, successive governments obsess about not putting up the basic rate of income tax. At the time, they've allowed fiscal drag to, draw, to take three million more people into higher rate. Um, at what I would regard as relatively modest levels of, in of income. So I think that the, bringing everything forward, bringing everything forward at UK level, bringing things forward at the UK level, and actually having a serious parliamentary debate about it. Um, but obviously part of the political power of chancellors uh, involves not telling people what's going to be in the budget. Uh, if I might just add one point. Um, I, I quite understand the concern about the impact of UK level decisions being taken that then impact, um, as it were, a Scottish Scottish public finances because the tax decision has already been taken. In pri in principle, the approach that I understand has been agreed for um, making the the tax adjustment in the block grant, the so-called index deduction route, is supposed to allow for those changes in the tax base as well. Um, which then in turn has the further advantage, if it works properly, of reducing the significance of the, of the, of what, of the guarantee of the no detriment principle, uh, because it shifted it to what ought to be an arithmetical figure, because you're looking at the overall base, not, in, not particularly components of that. Whether that's so is, in fact, another question, and it's something that I would strongly recommend your committee look at. But that is the, that is the principle that lies behind that approach to making the reduction in the block grant to allow for the Scottish rate of income tax. Professor Heald, a good budget is one with nothing exciting in it, is a, a quote I may borrow, uh, if that's OK, at some point going forward. Um, just, just finally then, again, Professor Heald, in your paper, you talked about, I think you described it as the weakening of local government, um, at least from a financial point of view, and that they're their tax powers um, compared to, say, 10, 15 years ago are, are lower now than they were. Um, this is an issue that uh, I guess will have to be addressed in Scotland, um, whether we become independent or not. It's an issue that will have to be addressed in England, Wales, and indeed in Northern Ireland. I just wonder if, if, from your point of view, have you done any work on this specifically about how it might be addressed, or are you simply, at this stage, flagging up uh, the issue? Simply flagging, simply flagging up the issue. Uh, my knowledge of local government finance has deteriorated over the years, but um, of the, if you want a, a property tax, is a perfectly sensible tax for local authorities. Um, but the political system above local authorities is going to not make the power unusable. So the power of setting council tax has become un effectively unusable for local authorities. Uh, and that kind of mirrors my concern that the use of, of, of a devolved income tax might become uh, unu unusable as well. Um, clearly, what's needed in council tax is a revaluation. Uh, there, there needs to be a regular cycle of revaluation. Uh, the, um, I thought that all the discussion four years ago about mansion tax was completely misguided because you could very easily break the top bands of, top bands of, uh, of council tax up. Um, incidentally, most of the benefit of that would go into a very limited number of local authorities, and you, which will probably have to go through the equalisation system anyway. Um, but so there, but you, there is a, a political problem, because whenever you do a council tax revaluation, people will assume that uh, their bills will go up. Well, some people's bills are going to go up very significantly because of the misalignment between value existing bands and the property market reality. So you've got to have a mechanism at the Scotland level and a mechanism at the England level, which will probably be quite tight central control for a period to make sure that, it, make sure that average tax rates didn't go up. And because it will be 25 years before anything's done at the minimum... The, the damping process to make sure people don't get hit with a really big bill, big bill increase are going to be over a long term. Hey, thank you. Uh, I think you'll be witnesses will be glad to know that I'm the last uh, committee member to ask questions. Um, I mean, Professor Trench, if, listening to you, and you've talked about a lot of different taxes uh, over the last couple of hours, um, you were pretty positive about controlling VAT because it's growing and controlling alcohol duty um, because that also there's a social issue in there which we need to address in Scotland. And neither of these 
can be controlled under devolution because of the European Union rules. So are you actually saying that these are argu that would be a strong argument for independence? <laughs> um, that's, uh, I'm saying that if you, what we are trying to do is to finance a devolved government within the UK, given how the UK works and the various constraints that the UK has, these are the means, th th this, this appears to be the best mechanism for doing it. Um, and these are the difficulties and this is how you might address them. Um, because the decision about whether Scotland should become independent or not is being taken above, certainly above my pay grade, and I suspect above yours by the people of Scotland. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, Professor Heald, um, you mentioned um, in paragraph 14 about the kind of, uh, some of the frightening prospects of uh, cuts in, in UK expenditure. I mean, have we got any actual kind of figures on these as to what... Uh, you specifically mentioned the NHS 9.1% reduction, what that would mean in England and what that would mean to the Scottish budget? Well, the, the, um, those num the, the, there are no number Because of the election, because of the UK general election, spending review, spending review 2013 only dealt with one year. So there's only disaggregation of spending for one year, but there are totals for the next three years. And that, those numbers are things which Institute for Fiscal Studies and Office for Budget Responsibility have actually projected forward, given you know, government statements about both the totals and the protection of health and health and schools ex, ex, health and schools expenditure. Um, I think there's an element in those numbers where the OBR and IFS are flagging up questions about the actual sustainability of those numbers, whether it really is possible to reduce public expenditure in those areas by so much. So I think there's a kind of political flagging uh, going on going on there. But, but if, if, if that does happen, that will actually produce, uh, with the continuation of Barnet, it will produce negative, uh, negative Barnet consequentials. But there is a, the, UK, the UK as a whole is facing a moment when it has to decide about whether it wants to pay taxes or whether it wants to go to a level of public spending last seen, I think, IFS said in 1948, as a proportion of GDP. Um, despite the fact that we know from all the fiscal sustainability projections that demographic change, uh, the proportion of older people and the effects on health expenditure, mean that there's going to be intense pressures. And uh, I think one of the things which one of the things which has happened in Scotland is that the kind of Scottish government has softened some of the sharpness of what's happened in England by the fact it's had the expansion of flexibility. So there hasn't been, um, you know, the Scottish, Scottish local government might think it's had a bad time, but compared to what happened to northern industrial cities in England, it hasn't had anything like as bad a time. And that has been part of the advantage of actually the discretion that Scotland possesses. The choice uh, of, over which we have little control uh, by a future UK government was to uh, reduce expenditure. That inevitably f f flows through to Scotland, as you've just said, by the Barnett formula. So we would be hit by both the actual f cut and then on top of that, potentially any Barnett changes. So it would be the two no, things... It's come through as Barnett changes. Sorry, they come through as Barnett, but if Barnett itself was reorganised... Potentially. Oh, well, you you mean it, 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 yes? Okay. It, it, if something takes the place of Barnet, and it is assumed that Scotland is presently funded too generously, there would be that as well. Yes. So, right, so. It'd be two things: the, re yes. the kind of real cut plus the the Barnet reorganisation. Right. Okay. Thanks. Um, Professor Trench, I mean, you mentioned a welfare once or twice in your papers, I think, first of all, a paragraph five, you, you, you seem to be kind of assuming that welfare is not something that could really be devolved to any greater extent, or, or you're maybe just forecasting that you don't think there's an appetite for it. As you may know, we've done quite a lot of work through the IPPR project on welfare as well, and published a report earlier this year called Devo More and Welfare that addressed these issues in some detail and um, recommended, recommended devolution of some benefits, including notably housing benefit and attendance allowance, 
and a power to provide supplemental work, for, for devolved governments to be able to provide supplemental benefits, um, cash benefits if they wish from their resources. But also recommended that um, if you, Scotland remains in the UK, that there needs to be as part of that an ongoing social union that embraces key elements of the redistributive welfare state, notably old age pensions and also benefits like job seekers allowance and the disability and incapacity benefits. Um, and that's, um, th that, that I think has to be part of, um, and again, another, it's another implication of a no vote, that um, part, bit remaining in the UK means that there remains a substantially a UK-wide welfare state. And um, there would be, with, particularly with the power to supplement welfare under this model, um, a very extensive scope for Scotland to provide more generous levels of welfare benefits if it saw fit. Um, but that those rights that, are, that would be part of the social union would exist across the UK and be held in common for all UK citizens, whether they lived in Scotland, in England, Wales, Northern Ireland. Um, so that's, that is the, the essential presupposition there. Um, and we found it quite hard to work out how you would devolve more benefits, other areas of welfare, even if that were desirable outright. Um, it would be quite problematic in a number of ways to do and would impose, um, we thought, asymmetric risks given the nature of welfare spending and the, the ability of the larger government to manage those because it's got access to a wider tax base. If I could come in, uh -huh. the, the, there is, I think, over the last few years, a challenge to long-standing concepts about territorial equalisation in the UK. I've emphasised them in the context of context of England. Um, the South East, the South East, London, the South East transfers significant significant revenues to the rest of England, and the, pe the, the people, the, the, the affluent areas, are more questioning about their transfers to poorer areas than they were before. In a way, you could argue that, that at an individual level, people who are, people who are well off are more questioning about transfers to people who are, who are less, less well off. The point I would make is that there's often controversy in Aberdeen and the northeast of Scotland about, about Aberdeen not being as well-funded as Glasgow, for example. So that even within Scotland, there are arguments about... Who actually get who actually gets the who actually gets the money? So there are, there's 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 equalisation issues at a UK level, but also equalisation issues within the UK. Specifically, coming back to your question about welfare, um, I don't quite know where I don't really quite know where the line exists, but I do have some sympathy with the view that you know the kind of national insurance, social security, national insurance, and social security probably do belong to the higher level. This is a kind of very troublesome issue, troublesome issue in Belgium, where most of public services are most of public services are devolved, uh, but wealth, the, social, the social security is actually still operated at a federal level, but uh, but under cha un, under challenge. Um, so there is a, there's a question of how far you go, and as people as people individually, and territorially start wanting to keep what they, to keep what they kill and there becomes more reluctance to actually make those geographic transfers that's the area i was kind of interested in because this idea i mean i think the argument seems to be that the welfare uh, side is so fundamental to the uk it has to be kept centrally but i mean some people would argue that for the nhs as well and yet the nhs has been devolved and I think we are seeing some differences in the way the NHS is going. And, I mean, on top of that, even within welfare, although it's not devolved, the two largest parties here agreed that we didn't like the bedroom tax and £50 million was found to kind of deal with that. So if th there's a desire to go into that area. Why is the NHS and welfare different? Um, well, it's partly that you are where you are, and w the NHS was devolved in large part because administration of the NHS was a matter for the Scottish office, um, whereas welfare has been in the hands of the DWP and its predecessor department since the welfare state was created. But Scottish Health Service, or the NHS in Scotland, was always administered by the Scottish office um, and devolution built on those routes. Um, I suspect that many people think that the way that, 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 that the NHS in particular was devolved 
um, was probably not the best way of doing it, simply in the sense that um, some sort of high-level definition of what the NHS should be about might have been a good idea um, to have been written into the settlement, so that you would have defined the purpose of the NHS as being to provide universal care free at the point of use. Um, whereas as matters stand, it would be completely open to Scottish Government to abolish the NHS, if it were, or Scottish Parliament, to abolish the NHS if it wished to. Um, there's obviously no political will to do that. But, but, but that's, that's a choice that would be open in Scotland, as it is in England. Um, the difference, of course, is that in England there's access to a wide range of other policy levers to shape and implement some sort of replacement for health care. And that would be much harder to find in a Scottish context. And to use your example of the welfare of, of, the, of, of, of the bedroom tax or spare room subsidy, you found a, a, a way through, but you had to find a rather intricate way through. Um, and that itself involved a measure of legal accommodation uh, uh, from the UK government in order to make sure that could happen. Um, what I'd like to see is a much more straightforward way to be able to accomplish similar ends. And that's the purpose of the supplemental welfare power. Some welfare uh, being transferred, but not just not the whole thing. Indeed. Yeah. And, and, and as I say, I mean, key, key to the Devo Moore model um, is the idea that there is a power to provide supplemental welfare. So if Scotland decides that, um, that UK levels of welfare benefits in some particular area are inappropriate, it's able to find, if it can find the resources, to supplement those. Could, it, could I just come in on, on your question about why the NHS is different from welfare? I think that psychologically, people do distinguish between cash benefits and services in kind. Uh, it might not be entirely rational that people make that distinction, but there's, there's, there will be kind of very strong um, political opposition in the UK and in Scotland to actually differentiate um, old age pensions according to which part of the UK you live. So there, there, is, there are some things where people, even though the purchasing power of old age pensions actually varies a lot depending on where you live, um, there's, there's on, the, on the cash uh, cash, district, cash transfers, I think there, there, there is a kind of reluctance, a reluctance to actually depart in the same way that you would get political opposition to a regional minimum wage. You know, the much lower, much lower minimum wage in Glasgow and Newcastle than in more prosperous parts of parts of the, parts of the UK. Oh, so, sorry, on that point, I mean, living wage is regional, is it not? Because it's different in minimum, London anyway. Yeah, but the minimum wage isn't. Yes. So, so I mean, the, the living wage at the moment is a kind of voluntary type, yes. is voluntary type mechanism. So there is a reluctance to go that way, whereas um, you know, clearly has already been said, uh, the, the Scotland's all, always had its own administrative institutional structures for, for the NHS. But this relationship between service, ca cash and services is obviously a difficult one. So my instinct is that you don't, don't devolve welfare to a, to a Scottish Parliament, but there will be lines of it, there will be areas where you might take a different view, where there's a clear connection, for example, housing benefit, where very clear connection to a devolved function, you may well manage the system much better. So, so there are areas where I think it, the choices are quite difficult, but I would be sympathetic to certain things. But I still think the unified social security system is actually quite an important part of that union. If we said to Scottish pensioners, you know, do you want to stay with the UK pension or would you take a pound more from the Scottish government? I bet they'd all want devolution. Well, but, but the obvious question is how are you going to finance that pound more? That's the point. I mean, everybody's very keen on spending more money, but nobody tells me how are you going to raise that extra money. And funding the event more would let you provide an extra pound to Scottish pensioners if you wished. Um, yeah. Though, though it, the, I have to say, I think the administrative costs of an extra pound would probably exceed any benefit. Uh, you mentioned to Professor Trench in, in paragraph 20, the National Insurance Fund. Uh, I mean, there's this whole misconception that people think there's a fund sitting there with yeah. all their national insurance contributions in it. I mean, you've also kind of argued against, um, you know, Scotland handling national insurance maybe and... and income tax together and yet you know it seems to me that by combining the two that would be a huge step forward we could simplify the system that would actually help business as well if it was simplified well, I'm not sure would. I, mean, um, I don't know how much you, you, you know about the nature of the National Insurance Fund um, it is as I found when I, I have to say when I started this work I knew very little about it because 
Um, like Professor Heald, I regarded national insurance as essentially a tax under a slightly different name that was in some vague way tied to the contributory principle that we all knew was not very serious. What, you find, what I found when I dug into this was that there is this entity called the National Insurance Fund, and national insurance contributions, both employers and employees, are paid into it. This is in contrast to every other source of tax revenue, whether it's capital gains tax, corporation tax, income tax, whatever, which are paid into the consolidated fund. And the consolidated fund could be regarded as the master account for taxation. And the way that the devolved block grant works is that there is an appropriation to the Secretary of State, who um, made by an appropri the Appropriation Act at Westminster, um, and the Secretary of State then passes that into the Scottish Consolidated Fund, which is established under the Scotland Act 1998, and that's the accounting mechanism. The National Insurance Fund stands wholly outside this structure, or very largely outside this structure. Um, it is a separate fund. The national insurance contributions are paid into it, and paid out of it are various national insurance liabilities, except that, first, the national insurance liabilities are defined in an odd way that, 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 that derives from the statutes that created our structure of national insurance, but doesn't correspond to modern understanding of it. So there is a contribution made to the NHS, for example, to cover certain maternity services that is paid out of the National Insurance Fund, even though we understand the NHS is being funded out of general taxation. And second, because in something like three years out of five, there is usually some sort of deficit in the National Insurance Fund, it is, that deficit is made up from general taxation because behind the National Insurance Fund stands the Consolidated Fund. Now, this account of how the system works um, is is not the same as our conventional understanding of what the system actually ought to be. And in order to redress that, you would need to make some really quite extensive administrative changes. As I said earlier, the last changes that were made to the National Insurance Fund were made in as long back as 1975, and they themselves were fairly limited in extent. So... I mean, yeah. Once you get into this, it's, 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 it's a long and complicated story and a longer story. I think you're putting the case for the whole thing needs a, a serious look at, quite apart from independence and devolution. I mean, do, do you think the thing, whole thing needs a serious look at? I think so. And, I mean, I'd note that, that um, work by others in IPPR um, has recently been talking much more about the nature of the contributory principle and how that should be um, operated in... Uh, in relation to the UK welfare state. So there is a much, much wider debate, and the moment one starts to get into the debate about restructuring the National Insurance Fund, you, one is also into these much wider debates. And apart from anything else... That in the next few years? I think there is an appetite. The timescale on which it will play out, I don't know, and I would not want to see a scheme for substantial enhancement of devolution held up pending resolution of these very complicated matters that have been shelved for a long time and possibly for quite good reason. Devolu I mean, the de enhanced so devolution is too pressing to allow for that. Right. Okay. Um, the, the final area I just wanted to touch on, I mean, we've talked about Barnet and, uh, you know, how much resources Scotland should get and um, based on needs and all sorts of things. But, I mean, are there other factors in this equation? For example, Scotland contributes more, therefore Scotland should get more. Uh, how about if Scotland votes no, we should get a kind of bonus or a thank you for that? Um, a, a loyalty bonus. Uh, that's right. How about, you know, how about uh, a nuclear weapons bonus for uh, holding them and the extra risk involved? I mean, I'd go for about four billion a year for that. So, I mean, surely there are other factors in here if we're looking at future finances other than just purely need. Um, well. DUM war is not simply about need. Um, there are a number of other factors, and DUM war tries to address quite a number of them. Um, I think that things like a loyalty bonus or a nuclear tax, a nuclear weapons bonus, are essentially part of the, are, are, are really not not on the cards, um, and I'm not sure that they were advanced entirely seriously. Um, the idea that, that Scotland should receive more because it contributes more assumes that that's what's so, and that's a, that's a fairly debatable point. But in any case, I think one could say that's pr pretty much where actually Scotland already is. Um, and that's not the rationale for the system, but that is, um, and it's not the way it's meant to work, but it does appear to be where Scotland presently is. And... 
Um, whether that remains the case at, uh, into the future is going to be a matter for further discussion, I suspect. I mean, that's a, a, a territorial political question. If you look at two federations that look quite similar, Canada and Australia, um, if you get natural resources in Queensland and Western Australia, you do not benefit from them, because, except in the economic base you benefit, but you don't benefit from tax revenues because they'll be equalised away by, largely equalised away by the uh, Commonwealth Grants Commission. In Alberta, in contrast, the fact that the oil province is Alberta means that Alberta is incredibly rich. And Alberta's, Alberta, for example, has much lower income tax than many other, many other Canadian provinces. Uh, clearly, one of the things that distinguishes those two examples from the United Kingdom is that they're massive countries. Uh, they're, they're massive countries with big, big distances, which make the tax system a lot easier to operate in certain ways. But it's a political question that if the resources, if the oil is in Scotland, does Scotland keep it? If the oil is in Shetland, does Shetland keep it? Um, that very clearly, that's a political question. And I say you can point out international examples where, where partly because of constitutional provisions when the oil was found, um, the, the, the Alberta keeps it and, and Queensland doesn't. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for that. It's concluded questions from the committee. I just want to see. You. If either of uh, Professor Heald or uh, Professor Trench want to make any final, final points. Thank you very much for uh, giving us the, the opportunity to come and appear before you. No, I, you with that. Yes, no, well, thank you very much for that. I mean, I have to say your evidence has been uh, first class, uh, very interesting. Thank you. So without further ado, I am going to uh, suspend the meeting till the public and the official report to leave as we decided to take the next three items in private. So I'll just have a caller. Two minute recess.